good morning and a warm welcome to all from different time zones across the globe good morning i welcome you all uh, to the inaugural function of this international virtual training program on advanced microscopic techniques in biomedical research scheduled from the 20th 28th to 30th of january 2021 we'll start this function with the national song before we start the program it is customary that we play our university song so now we'll have our university song play जय जय हो श्री वेंकटेश्वर पशु वैद्य विश्वविद्यालय जय हो नमो नमो 
ಕಾಮೋ ತಿರುಮಲ ವೆಂಕಂದ ಕಡುಪು ನಿಂಪಿನ ಗೋ ಕ್ಷೀರ ಕಾಂತಿ ಗೋಪುರಮ ಜಯ ಮೂಗ ಜೀವ ಜರ ಮರಣ ವ್ಯಾಧಿ ಬಾಧ ನಿವಾರಿಂಚು ಯುವ ವೈದ್ಯುಲ ತಯಾರಿಂಚು ಕರುಣಾರಸ ಮಂದಿರಮ ಚೇಪ ಗುರ್ರೆ ಮಾಂಸ ಪರಿಶ್ರಮಲ ಚೇತನ ಮಾ ನವ್ಯಾಂಧ್ರ ರಾಷ್ಟ್ರ ಶ್ವೇತ ಅರುಣ ನೀಲ ವರ್ಣ ವಿಪ್ಲವ ನವ ಕೇತನ ಮಾ ಸಸ್ಯ ವಿಪ್ಲವಾನಿ ಕಿ ಸಮಧೀಟ ಗುಧಿ ದರ್ಪ ಮಾ ಅದ್ಭುತ ಗ್ರಾಮೀಣ ಪರಿಶ್ರಮಲ ಮಾತೃ ಗರ್ಭ ಮಾ ಪೇದರಿಕಂ ಪ್ರಕ್ಷಾಳನ ನಿರುದ್ಯೋಗ ನಿರ್ಮೂಲನ ಸ್ವಯಂ ಉಪಾಧಿ ಶಿಕ್ಷಣ ಬೋಧನ ಪರಿಶೋಧನ ವಿಸ್ತರಣ ಭೂಮಿ ಕಲುಗ ವೆಲಸಿನ ಮಾ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರವೇತ ರಾಚಾರ್ಯುಲ ಪೀಠ ಮಾ ಆಚರಣ ಜೀವ ಪಾಠ ಮಾ ಜಯ ಯುವ ಮಹಿಳಾ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥುಲ ವಿದ್ವತ್ ವಿದ್ಯುಲ್ಲತ ಕೀರೆ ಅಧ್ಯಾಪನ ಜ್ವಾಲ ಕುರ್ರಾಳನು ಕುರ್ರಾಲುಗ ಪರುಗೆತ್ತಿಂಚೆ ವಿಕ್ರಮ ಕ್ರಮ ಕ್ರಮ ಶಿಕ್ಷಣ ಶಾಲಾ ಜಾತಿ ಕಿ ಬಲಮೈನ ಆಹಾರ ಪುಬಾಜತ ನಿರಿಗಿನ ತಲ್ಲಿ ಜಗತಿ ನಿಮನ ಆಂಧ್ರ ಜಾತಿ ಪುರೋಗತಿ ನಿ ಸಾಧಿಲ್ಸಗ ನಡಿ ಪಿಲ್ಸು ನವ್ಯ ದೀಪಿಕ ಕಲ್ಪ ವೃಕ್ಷಮೈ ಕಾಮಧೇನು ವೈ ಜೀವಿಲ್ಸಬೆ ಸಂಕಲ್ಪ ಶಾಂತಿ ಗೀತಿಕ ಜಯ 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 ಶ್ರೀ ವೆಂಕಟೇಶ್ವರ ಪಶು ವೈದ್ಯ ವಿಶ್ವವಿದ್ಯಾಲಯ ಜಯ greetings and a warm welcome to all in different time zones across the globe on behalf of the department of veterinary anatomy in the entire college of veterinary science gannavaram under the aegis of sri venkateswara veterinary university in the state of andhra pradesh in india i once again welcome you all to the inaugural function of the international virtual training program on advanced microscopic techniques in biomedical research from the 28th to 30th of january 2021 we have with us all our university authorities and our chief guest honorable vice chancellor of kerala veterinary and animal sciences university professor dr mr sesindra nath sir to just brief you about this uh, training program as has been said in the brochure newer technologies are coming up in the areas of uh, biomedical research so in this context uh, we wanted to organize this uh, virtual training program we had earlier conducted a web conference on the advances uh, in teaching and research in veterinary anatomy and prior to that we have conducted a national workshop offline and we have also conducted a series of international webinars so with that experience we thought that we will be conducting a virtual training program on different microscopic techniques in biomedical research to benefit participants across the globe so with that view point we have initiated this and i should initially thank our university authorities our honorable vice chancellor our dean of veterinary science and our associate dean of the college of here they have given the support to go ahead and uh, start this program and uh, i am happy to note that uh, 
we have uh, 523 participants uh, who have registered of which 66 of them are from 35 international universities uh, of 16 countries and uh, 67 are from 52 non veterinary institutions and the remaining 390 are from 100 veterinary institutions or clinics or research laboratories we have got a total of 107 universities or institutions across the world uh, participating in this uh, program and uh, we have participants from the usa turkey italy china nepal finland malaysia iran iraq nigeria indonesia pakistan bangladesh jamaica spain and the united kingdom so we are happy that we are able to disseminate uh, such good information from eminent speakers uh, to so many participants across the globe uh, and project our sri venkateshwara veterinary university strength it is also happy to note that uh, we are having a youtube channel for this anatomy department since august 2019 and we are able to provide infinite viewership to all giving live streaming on the youtube and we have already got nearly 600 subscribers and 9000 viewers in this uh, youtube channel and uh, as part of this program we have also arranged uh, an e quiz uh, for the pg and phd scholars on the topics uh, that will be deliberated during this virtual training program on the third day just before the valedictory function so that is the schedule of the events so now i would like to welcome all our uh, dignitaries i would request our uh, dean of uh, veterinary science uh, professor chandrashekar rao garu to preside over the function and uh, carry out the formalities of uh, conducting these uh, proceedings i am also happy to invite and introduce to all uh, krishnan nayar sir uh, who is joining us uh, from uh, california san diego sir is an octogenarian aged uh, 85 years sir we recognize you on the screen sir we thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us and now i hand over the proceedings uh, to the president of today's function the dean of veterinary science uh, professor ts chandrashekar rao garu to carry out the proceedings and inviting our vice chancellor honorable chief guest uh, our associate dean and uh, krishna nayar sir over to you sir Uh, good morning everyone i welcome chief guest dr m r sheshendranath honorable vice chancellor of kerala veterinary and animal sciences university and our honorable vice chancellor and guest of honor dr v padmanabh reddy garu and eminent pathologist and former dean uh, manuthi veterinary college dr krishnan nayar who is a very well known uh, pathologist uh, not only in india and also abroad and i <coughs> uh, welcome uh, an associate dean organizing committee and all the participants to this 3 day um, virtual training program on advances in microscopic techniques in biomedical research so now i request dr a ravi associate dean to address the uh, the meeting dr ravi dr ravi please Dr. Ravi. Sir, maybe you have to unmute, sir. Ravi, sir.
Hello. Hello, am I audible Hello. now? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, there is a problem with the net here in the room. Okay. Yes. Sorry for the disturbance, convenience. Um, so, good morning. I, on behalf of uh, veterinary, NTR College of Veterinary Science, Gannavaram, a constant college of the Vankasar Veterinary University, welcome our chief guest, uh, Dr. M. R. Asindra Nathan Sar, our uh, beloved Vice Chancellor, our Dean, University Officers, and Dr. Krishnan Nair, all the participants, the eminent speakers, the faculty and students from across the globe. I'm happy that uh, this college is organizing this the eighth webinar. This is the eighth one, and we have organized these eight webinars over the past three months. And it is appreciable that Dr. Kishore has been in the forefront in five out of these eight webinars in organizing these webinars. And uh, these webinars, particularly the previous one organized by Pharmacology Department has evoked a lot of response, wherein a training, pro a training program on application of SPLC, I observed that instead of webinar, the training programs evoke much wider response than the webinars. And the feedback from the students, the research scholars has also been very good. And this webinar, this advanced microscopic technique in biomedical research, is uh, well conceived by Dr. Kishore. My special appreciation to him once again. And the topic is so important that um, that's why it has evoked a response from wide spectrum of participants, both national and international, both from veterinary, non-veterinary and medical fields. And I am de definitely uh, hopeful that the deliberations, the presentations here will enrich the knowledge of the faculty, the students, and my special appreciation to all the resource persons, the eminent resource persons who are sparing their valuable time to uh, throw their knowledge, to share their knowledge with us. And I once again uh, appreciate them and express my gratitude to all the eminent uh, uh, resource persons who will be sharing their knowledge with us. And I am uh, confident that this will be a successful one and the feedback will also be a great one. And I once again express my gratitude to our university officers, our vice chancellor, dean, and all the university officers, and Dr. Kishore and his team for coming out uh, for their support and for organizing this uh, seminar. Thank you all. Thank you. Hello, what is that? Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi. So, at the outset, I would like to congratulate Dr. A. Ravi and his team, particularly Dr. P. V. S. Kishore, for, for taking initiative in organizing this three days virtual training program. I congratulate Dr. Ravi being the principal investigator of National Agricultural Higher Educational Project. He has been sponsoring several webinars, international and national webinars. This is one among them. So I congratulate Dr. P. V. S. Kishore uh, for choosing the appropriate topic. And I'm glad to know that uh, the there are 523 participants that too from 147 universities or institutions, including 36 overseas universities from uh, 16 countries, and um, which include 100 veterinary institutions. And since the topic is very uh, relevant, you find so many participants from the other sciences also, elite sciences and pure sciences. This is one good uh, aspect of this training program. And I am um, happy to note that during validity function, another eminent uh, anatomist from uh, Sinovac, a very internationally renowned anatomist will be the chief guest for the validity function. Now, the, as I look at the topics to be delivered by the eminent speakers, including Dr. Krishna Nair and others. So here, the molecular imaging with reference to the reproductive processes and characterization of stem cells, then um, uh, immunohistochemistry and electron microscopy and lectin histochemistry or in situ hybridization. These are very relevant fields that have been chosen uh, to be delivered by different eminent speakers. 
I am happy to note that our university is also has got strong base uh, uh, in some of these um, fields like uh, electron microscopy and immunohistochemistry. And uh, the uh, in our uh, United University, um, the Hyderabad Veterinary College was the probably the third veterinary college in India to have electron microscopic facility besides the Manuti Veterinary College and Madras Veterinary College. So I. <clears throat> I hope the proceedings of this three-day training program will be very fruitful. And um, I'm very happy to note that Dr. Krishna Nair is able to participate in this uh, training program and give his valuable uh, address. Now, uh, I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Padna Bredigaru, who, who under whose leadership our university is able to conduct several such programs, you know, uh, in, in line with the uh, national trend in view of the COVID situation, our university has also been conducting several uh, webinars uh, like this under the dynamic leadership of our Honorable Vice Chancellor. I thank him for all his cooperation uh, for the um, all such activities. Now I request uh, uh, Dr. V. Padna Bredigaru, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, to address the uh, meeting. Thank you, Dr. Chinshekar uh, Good morning to all of you. Let me uh, welcome once again on behalf of the University, uh, Sheshindranath Garu, the Honorable Vice Chancellor. I also um, thank profusely for the organizers for giving me the small opportunity for interacting with various uh, uh, scientists who are connected throughout the globe from the different uh, time zones. It's not so easy to organize a webinar when uh, the scientists who are uh, re uh, residing in various parts of the country uh, to, to come online at the same time. This is a very great effort. Now, uh, one more thing, last, uh, for the last one year, we are uh, suffering from with a great uh, uh, pandemic of uh, COVID-19. Uh, this COVID-19 has uh, uh, brought more, so many life, lifestyle changes. We are not able to see good friends, sometimes not able to meet the parents. In, in this kind of uh, situations, I really appreciate Kishore for coming again and again with the idea of uh, conducting the webinar. Really, I congratulate him. His energies are tremendous. He has done um, uh, too many webinars and various uh, topics. Uh, this is the first time, I think so, uh, to come on the virtual training program. And um, uh, today's the training program is the International Virtual Training Program and Advanced Microscopic Techniques in Biomedical Research. And I heard that this training program is going to be for three days from 28th to 30th of this month. So the microscopy is always a very fascinating subject for me. Uh, just now, Chandrasekhar was telling that uh, uh, Hyderabad is having the third electron microscope, probably in veterinary institutions. Uh, I'm having a strong desire to establish an electron microscopic facility in uh, our university. We are planning, but we are uh, also scrambling for uh, resources. Once our ideas are coming into practical things, probably we'll be having shortly the electron microscopic facility in our university also. Coming back to the subject or theory of this particular um, uh, training program, microscopy has revolutionized our understanding of biological events. This all, uh, all of us know. Microscopic techniques have provided insights into the dynamics of biological process that regulates such events. Biological diversity to large extent depends on the advances in imaging techniques. Various microscopic techniques have emerged as central and indispensable tools in the biomedical sciences. Microscopic techniques have proven useful in complex investigations into the mysterious of lives and spanning across disciplines such as microbiology, molecular biology and cell biology, tissue engineering, biomedical and 
regenerative medicine and so on and so forth advances in microscopic <laughs> enable visualization of a broad range of new micro morphological and functional features the virtual training program emphasizes on the techniques in the electron microscopy and interpretation of ultra structures of the cells with their biological significance the techniques in immuno histochemistry in situ hybridization stem cells multi dimensional molecular imaging and lectin histochemistry this program is intended to disseminate knowledge to the benefits of academia and researchers of various professionals in biomedical sciences it provides young as well as experienced scientists a state of art of multidisciplinary overview of the microscopic techniques covering all major microscopy fields in biomedical sciences and showing their application in evaluating the samples ranging from molecules to cells and tissues new microscopy techniques present opportunities to also develop improved diagnostic tests the covid-19 pandemic opened up the virtual opportunity to sri venkateshwara veterinary university to conduct this program online mode i hope that this training program will give participants a broad view and solid background of various advanced microscopic techniques in future biomedical research work and to answer key questions in basic and applied research I, just now as the organizers were telling that uh, more than 520 participants from more than 100 institutions are participating in this virtual training program it is really 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 a great effort for bringing all of them onto the you know, platform for this uh, virtual training program i really congratulate them and also uh, wish best of luck to all the participants thank you for giving this opportunity good luck word to president uh give me that it is my pleasure to request dr pivesh kishore to introduce chief guest to the, all the participants dr kishore dr kishore thank you sir we are very happy that uh, professor mr sesindranath sir the honorable vice chancellor of kerala veterinary and animal sciences university kodai kerala in india has kindly consented immediately to accept our invitation and to be the chief guest on this uh, occasion i thank you for that uh, sir you were the one who made uh, this online webinars or web conferences or trainings uh, possible right from the beginning of the covid-19 pandemic that struck in the march 2019 so i think most of the universities in the country took a cue from you to organize such events and uh, i was one of the persons who participated in all your events and uh, benefited and we are able to do on behalf of our university also so for that uh, i thank you very much sir so i would like to introduce our honorable chief guest professor m r sesindar nath sir to all the participants and the dignitaries of the meeting sir was the former national consultant for un fpo cerf project at tiruvananthapuram and delhi he was the pro- former professor and head of tvcc at college of veterinary science and animal husbandry tripura he was the former professor at university head and former director of academic and research in kerala veterinary animal sciences university before becoming the honorable vice chancellor sir was very meritorious during his uh, college days he was the second topper during his bvsc days and he was the gold medalist uh, both in mvsc and uh, phd sir served in india for 39 years and he also has abroad experience of serving in libya from september 2009 to 
to March 2011 as associate professor during that time. Sir has uh, guided five doctorate students and 42 master's degree students. He has published uh, 117 research articles and 11 popular articles. He received uh, many awards. He got the best teacher award from Kerala Agricultural University in 2003 and the Bharat Ratna Dr. C. Subramanyam Award for Outstanding Teacher for the Biennium 2004-2005 for excellent teaching in the field of animal health from Indian Council of Agricultural Research. Sir, he is a fellow of the National Academy of Veterinary Science since 2006-2007 and he has got the best research articles for the Indian Society for Veterinary Medicine that award in 2006. Sir was the ISVM, Indian Society for Veterinary Medicine Organizing Committee awardee, and he got the first prize for the best oral presentation in 2000. He published 18 chapters in three books, three practical manuals for UG students, and three administrative books for the Kerala Veterinary and Animal Sciences University. He completed six research projects and participated in 18 symposia, conferences, and workshops, and 10 summer institutes for training, and he is a member of seven professional bodies. His major achievements include that he got the Indian Council of Agricultural Research, JRF, for pursuing his MBSc degree during 1978. He also got the Senior Research Fellowship, SRF, in 1994. He received the letter of appreciation from the then Honorable Vice Chancellor of Kerala Agricultural University for acting as the treasurer of the International Conference of the Smallholder Livestock Production Systems held during November 2000. Sir was the member of the core working group for uh, project preparation of the core raksha for FMD control in Kerala. He was a member of the expert team and review committee constituted by the government of Kerala for implementation of ADC. He was the convener for vigilance group formed by Kerala Agricultural University during FMD out in Kerala. He is a member of the Ethics Committee and is the convener for that committee at Manipur. He was a peer reviewer for the e-courses of uh, NIAP scheme of uh, Converse. He was examiner for master and doctorate degree programs for eight universities. He is the co-general convener and chairman of editorial board of ISVM in 2015. And he was the jury for the seventh international clinical conference held at Namakkal in 2015. Sir is an expert on rabies for the preparation of training modules for the Veterinary Council of India. He is the editorial board member of the Indian Journal of Animal Research, chairman of the Journal of Veterinary and Animal Sciences, Kerala Veterinary and Animal Sciences. Sir also acted as a, an inspector for the Veterinary Council of India. Sir, we are extremely happy, sir, that uh, you have consented to be the honorable chief guest and uh, we hope that your presence will benefit this international gathering. Thank you very much, sir. Over to the president. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kishore, for pre presenting the an inspiring biodata of an eminent uh, outstanding teacher that is recipient of Dr. C. Supramaniam Outstanding Teacher Award, Dr. M. R. Sheshindanath. Thank you, sir, for uh, sparing your valuable time with us. Now I request Dr. Sheshindanath to give his valuable address. Dr. Shashindana, sir. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, President of today's function, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Rao, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, of course, of Indonesia Veterinary University, Professor D. Anabriti, my most respected teacher, Professor M. Krishnamaya, uh, all other uh, uh, university, university officials, uh, Dr. Uh, Organization Secretary, Dr. P.V.S. Kishore, uh, distinct district history guests, fellow participants from across the globe, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy, really, very happy to participate in this normal function organized. Uh, uh, in connection with the international virtual training program on the advanced microscopic technique. 
I was uh, told by Dr. Kishore that uh, this international webinar on electron microscopy and the advanced techniques in uh, biomedical research uh, was planned long back. And uh, recently, when uh, KVAC also conducted uh, uh, one such similar uh, webinar program, but uh, unfortunately, some of the most of the people from outside. So, for the benefit of uh, others from uh, all, all over India as well as abroad, um, they were. Uh, it was interested to organize uh, one such uh, program, and uh, that is getting materialized today. And uh, from the former speaker's uh, um, talk, we all know that. More, nearly 500, more than 500 participants are already registered. And there's so many others are viewing this uh, YouTube channel. And uh, it covers nearly 16 countries. It covers, uh, it covers uh, nearly 35, more than 35 uh, veterinary and as well as uh, non veterinary institutions are participating. And uh, after going through these uh, uh, sessions, uh, Nearly seven sessions are there, and all these sessions are being held by eminent speakers and eminent experts in this concern field. So I am very happy and proud to say that uh, my most uh, respected teacher and my mentor, Professor Krishnan Nayar, is also handling one session, and uh, I am sure that uh, like all of us, but uh, speakers. Mr. Nisar's talk also will be of much useful for the academicians, the research scholars, students, and even practitioners in the field of a veterinary as well as non-veterinary. Because uh, uh, as far as uh, my professor Krishnanisar is concerned, Sir was instrumental in establishing this electron microscopy in Agriculture was in our college, College of Veterinary Animal Sciences in Manuti, during the 80s. And uh, I've got a lot of hands on experience that you will be realizing during the once you attend the, the, uh, the program. So uh, I appreciate the effort taken by uh, Dr. Kishore and his team for organizing this international webinar because. Uh, uh, they are in, this webinar certainly will be enlightening the, this particular category of students as well as academicians and research workers in this area. And uh, the, regarding uh, the organization, regarding the organization of this, I have to congratulate Dr. Kishore. I learned a lot about uh, Dr. Kishore and his team from my colleague here in Kerala, Dr. Ashok and his team, that are very enthusiastic and vibrant um, professors arranging this type of seminars, especially during this COVID season. Uh, we, we, the virtual form is the one which we can depend. And we have to, we must be grateful for this pandemic in one way to say that uh, across the globe, Participants are uh, uh, getting uh, enlightened, as well as part the, the speakers are also, eminent speakers are also taking part from across the globe. So this is, a, this is a, one of the mode of uh, seminars uh, for future days also. Because uh, even after the pandemic period, we will have to depend on this. It saves time, it saves uh, money, and so many others. And, uh, uh, so, depending on, uh, we have to have a blended form of teaching or seminars or workshop in future, the days to come. So, our students and our faculty, they have already adjusted to this uh, online mode and uh, they are mixing it, mixing this uh, offline and online for the, the for academic purpose as well as even for the hands on time. This, especially this international webinar is on. It's a hands on, on the, the practical side, the mainly dealing. That once you undergo this, uh, especially Krishna uh, 
uh, that particular topic because I I attended that uh, uh, last meeting uh, or the last webinar of a visualizer. It was just like uh, a practical training, but uh, each and every small ultrasound cells, ultrasound cells was pointed out in that. Like that, all other experts also will be doing that. I'm sure that, and uh, I'm uh, I uh, wish all success uh, to this online program. And uh, I express my gratitude to the honorable vice chancellor and uh, all other university officials, including Dr. Jamshed, for uh, giving me this opportunity to attend this. And I wish all success for this uh, webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, Dr. Sajnanath, sir. Now, it is my pleasure to request Dr. Krishnan Nair to address the meeting, sir. Dr. Krishnan Nair, sir. Dr. Krishnan Nair, sir. Sarah has to unmute. Sarah has to unmute. Sarah, you can. Hello. Yes, sir. We are getting your voice sir, now. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, I am very much thankful to Kishore, Dr. Kishore and all the organizers for giving me this opportunity. It is nearly 25 years since I left teaching and research, but this gave me an opportunity to go back, think, and present something. There may be a lot of defects because time has sharp, blunted many of my faculties, but I hope whatever I, I am presenting is a rerun of what I have done it earlier. So bear with me if there are defects, and I will be happy to clarify anything at the end of the and the end of my talk. The talk will be mostly audio because I had to show a lot of pictures. Thank you. The president, sir. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, now, sir, uh, I request uh, Dr. NKB Razu uh, to present the vote of thanks. Sir, one minute, sir. President, sir, just a moment, sir. OK. okay. Sir, uh, I request that I yeah. will be given an opportunity yeah. to introduce our yeah. Krishna Nair, sir, yeah. okay. to this audience. Sir will anyhow be introduced okay. uh, before his uh, talk, sir. His talk is tomorrow. Okay, Hello, sir? okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Sir, sir. Yeah, go are, ahead, please. Uh, we are very happy. We are very happy, sir, that uh, Professor Dr. Krishnan Nair, sir, uh, has accepted to be a part of this uh, virtual training program. In fact, uh, I have to give some acknowledgments uh, in this regard. As sir has said, uh, he has uh, given a complete, continuous two-hour length presentation on electron microscopic uh, techniques in an earlier uh, webinar hosted by Kerala Veterinary Animal Sciences University. I was a participant in that. 
And simultaneously, when we were planning this uh, broader virtual training program in biomedical sciences, uh, I requested the Kerala Veterinary and Animal Sciences University authorities. Uh, and uh, I'm very thankful to the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Kerala Veterinary and Animal Sciences University and Dr. N. Ashok, Director of Academics and Research, and Dr. Maya, the Professor and Head, uh, who has connected me to Professor Krishna Nair, sir. Krishna Nair, sir, as you might have known, by now he is an octogenarian he is 85 years old and he is joining us uh, in his uh, night time from san diego in california usa so it is my duty to introduce him to this audience uh, because we have had an opportunity sir joined uh, this also he will be introduced to all the participants uh, but this introduction will serve as introduction to the authorities who are there in the inaugural program. So I take this opportunity. Sir did his uh, doctorate from uh, Sweden under the guidance of uh, Professor Sven Rubart in 1969 to 73 from the Royal Veterinary College of Stockholm, uh, Sweden. He started his service as a lecture pathology in 1960. And then as associate professor, professor, dean, director of veterinary research education and all, he has got many fellowships from Royal Veterinary College of Sweden, European Society of Electron Microscopy, NAVS and IAVP in India. Sir, he is a visiting professor to University of Uppsala in Sweden and he is an invited speaker in India and in many countries abroad. He is the chairman and a member of National Committees of Veterinary Education and Research, published 120 mm -hmm. research papers and contributed chapters in textbooks. He was the president of Indian Association of Veterinary Pathologists for six years. He received many awards. He now lives in San Diego, California. So I took this uh, liberty, sir, uh, to to introduce you. I thank the president who has given me the opportunity to introduce sir uh, to the participants as well as the dignitaries of uh, today's inaugural uh, function. Thank, thank you, you sir for giving me the opportunity and over to you president sir. Yeah. Thank you Dr. Kishore. Now I request Dr. MKP Razu to propose vote of thanks. Please. Thank you sir. Thank you. Good morning to yeah. all of you. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Veterinary Anatomy, NTR College of Veterinary Science, Ganavaram, Sri Venkateshwara Veterinary University, Tirupati, uh, it is a great privilege for me to propose vote of thanks for the inaugural function of International Virtual Training Program on Advanced Microscopic Techniques in Biomedical Research, 28th to 30th, January 2021. First of all, I express my sincere and heartfelt thanks to our chief guest, Professor M.R. Sessindrana, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Kerala Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, who quote, In spite of SARS' busy schedule, he accepted our invitation and spared some time to bless and grace this occasion with his immense valuable speech on this occasion. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I extend my sincere and heartfelt thanks to Chief Patron and distinguished guest of today's function, Professor V. Padnav Ritigaru, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sri Venkateshwara Veterinary University, Tirupati, despite SARS busy schedule with the university activities, he accepted and spared some time to grace this occasion with his encouraging speech. Thank you, sir. It is my sense of gratitude and heartfelt thanks to patron and president of the today's function, Professor T.S. Chandrasekhar Garu, Dean of Veterinary Science, Sri Venkateshwara Veterinary University, Tirupati, for sparing his valuable time to grace this occasion. He is the man who, Magnanimous in accepting the proposals, timely giving sanctions, and helping this event a grand success. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I express my sincere gratitude and thanks to Professor 
Prof. Krishna Nair, sir, from USA, for his uh, valuable message to the person. I extend my sincere thanks to chairman of the today's function, Prof. A. Ravi, Associate Dean, Entire College of Veterinary Science, Ganavaram, for his immense valuable speech and providing a digital platform to conduct this online event. Thank you, sir. I extend my sincere thanks to the man who is behind this event, the organizing secretary, Professor P.V.S. Kishore, head of the Department of Veterinary Anatomy, NTR College of Veterinary Science, Ganavaram, for his untied and meticulous planning to conduct this virtual training program, a grand success and grand event. Thank you, sir. And I extend my heartfelt thanks to co-organizing secretary, Dr. M.P.S. Thoma, assistant professor of this department. So actually, he is the backbone and the technical man of the college for his sincere efforts to make this event. Thank you, Thoma. I extend my sincere thanks Please, to sir. all the speakers who accepted Very madam on the in uh, uh, helping this uh, uh, event uh, uh, and, uh, and for their help they rendered for this event. Thank you, all the speakers, eminent speakers. And extend my sincere thanks to PG and PhD scholars of this department for their sincere efforts and non teaching staff of this department also. I extend my heartfelt thanks to all the participants across the globe uh, and all the best for all the participants. You, I hope you will receive the best um, uh, deliberations from the eminent speakers. Once again, thank you one and all for making this uh, inaugural session a grand success. Thank you. Over to the president. The Dean Jinshaker said. Dr. Kishore? Yes, sir. Uh, please conclude the uh, session. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK. Yeah. So again, a very warm thank you to each and everyone who has made this uh, inaugural function a grand success. We are. Uh, on dot, maintaining the time frame, okay. and uh, we'll be shortly going with the technical schedule. As you might have all seen from the program schedule, uh, this virtual training program is spread across uh, three days, yeah. and we are in day one, and we have just completed the inaugural function, and uh, we have uh, three eminent resource persons. I hope uh, all of them have uh, joined. And uh, we start right now. It is uh, 2 to 3 minutes to 11 a.m. And uh, we are on time. And uh, hope uh, Dr. H.B.D. Prasad Rao, scientist E, National Institute of Animal Biotechnology, Hyderabad, is online. Sir, are you available? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So, Dr. H.B.D. Prasad Rao's uh, topic on witnessing the molecular mechanisms of livestock reproductive processes through multidimensional molecular imaging will be right now from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And then 
professor dr s ishwari professor and head center for stem cell research and regenerative medicine madras veterinary college chennai tamil nadu india madam are you available online I, I have seen Hello. you in the beginning. Yeah, yes, sir. Available. Sir, am I audible? Audible? Yeah, you are audible. Audible. Yeah, thank I you, have... madam. Okay. Okay, thank you, madam. Okay. Madam will be giving insights on the topic phenotypic characterization of stem cells by flow cytometry, and that will be after the lunch break. We'll break for lunch here after the first topic. between 12:30 to 1:30 and when we resume back after lunch at 1:30 we'll have the topic of professor dr s ishwar and that will be for an hour from 1:30 pm to 2:30 pm and after that we'll be having the topic of dr devendra patak associate professor department of veterinary anatomy college of veterinary science ludhiana punjab india and he'll be speaking on the topic immuno histochemistry step by step principles and protocols dr patak i see you on the screen welcome thank you welcome. sir welcome so we are exactly on time it is 11 am now and we have completed our inaugural function and we are on dot and prasad uh, sir are you ready yeah 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 i'm ready yeah okay so before we ask him to throw insights on to the topic let me introduce him to you all dr hbd prasad rao has done his bsc chemistry and msc biochemistry from andhra university in india and he has done his phd in biology from the school of biosciences Institute of Protein Research, Osaka University, Osaka, Japan, under the advisorship of Dr. Akira Shinohara, between 2007 to 2011, and he has a very rich research experience. Between 2004 to 2005, he was the JRF at IIT Kharagpur in India. and he worked on the induction and production of beta lane pigments from hairy roots of amaranthus tricolor after that from 2005 to 2006 he was in raj industries private limited bhavatan in pune in india and worked on the biomass to ethanol project isolation and identification of by products from lingocellulosic biomass to ethanol reactions from 2006 to 2011 he was an institute of uh, protein research he was there in osaka university in osaka japan as a graduate research assistant sir, under the advisor dr akira shinohara and uh, on the understanding the mechanisms of rapid chromosome movements in meiosis sir, he worked and uh, he revealed that uh, nuclear enveloped protein np3 sun domain protein phosphorylation dependent nuclear envelope remodeling facilities rapid movements of chromosomes during meiosis in saccharomyces cerevisiae after that he was in the university of california uc davis what we call in the department of molecular genetics and microbiology davis california as a post doctoral research associate under the advisorship of dr neil hunter from 2012 to 2017 so this is his rich research experience he has uh, many many publications uh, out of which uh, there are good uh, six uh, international uh, publications uh, in molecular uh, cell in science in nature genetics in international journal of uh, indigenous medicinal plants in genes to cells and cytology he is also credited with a patent a novel biofuel additive for diesel engines by professor p das professor s day dr r c professor b b ghosh and himself dr h v d prasad rao 
IT KGP PF 110605 with Indian patent number 2579421373 KYL 2006. So that is the patent credit that he has. He has many presentations. He has presentations in Embo Meiosis in London, in Howard Hughes Medical Institute Conference, Chevy Chase, Maryland, in the Japanese Society of Molecular Biology Congress in Yokohama, in Three Arts International Conference in Meiosis 2011 in Toyoma, in Chromosome Workshop in Kago Onsen, in the International Conference Chromosome Cycle in Osaka. in the japanese society of molecular congress uh, yokohama in addition to all this he has good uh, teaching and mentoring experience from 2007 to 2007 he, he was the graduate research assistant in the department of biology at osaka university and from 2012 to 2017 he was the undergraduate student mentor undergraduate honor physics co mentor in the uc davis university of california davis in the department of molecular genetics and uh, microbiology california he has several awards to his credits he got the jaso fellowship uh, of japan from 2008 to 2010 mext fellowship from japanese government in 2007 to 2011 r99 foundation fellowship japan from 2008 to 2010 graduate school of science international student fellowship 2007 to 2010 BMC fellowship from Osaka University 2008 to 2009 in the University of Davis California he worked on the microscopy course in 2014 and is associated with the professional organizations the genetic society of america as a gsa member from 2012 to 2017 and prior to that he was associated with the molecular biology society of japan mbsj as a member from 2017 2012 welcome dr hpd prasad rao with all the rich experience uh, that you have gained we hope that uh, you will throw great insights on the topic witnessing the molecular mechanisms of uh, livestock reproductive processes uh, through multi dimensional molecular image over to you and a big thanks to you for coming to participate and throw light on this thank you over to you uh, uh... Thank you, Dr. Kishor. Am I audible to everyone? Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kishor, for the like uh, complete uh, mind, complete biography. Uh, you made it available to all the members uh, who are participants and other members. Thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to thank you for giving me opportunity. You and uh, probably Dr. Thomas. Thomas insisted me to give me a talk. Uh, he uh, continuously was calling me to, you know, participate participate in this. Thank you very much. So hopefully I'll do my best. Uh, since it's a one and half hour program, so definitely, uh, uh, I guess uh, yes. So it, my screen is visible to you guys, everybody. Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. Sir. so i'll 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 make a justice at least um, um, uh, because uh, right now i'm in national institute of animal biotechnology working as a scientist mostly we work with uh, basically livestock related reproductive problems so that's what i thought this would be relevant as well as since this is a uh, common uh, platform for the other other students also so i'll touch upon a little bit human as well as more so that everybody will have the fun of this uh, particularly microscopy so thank you uh, for you guys also giving me this opportunity and uh, to be frankly we want to showcase nib and our work so that we can uh, you know absorb a lot of phd students as well as master students undergrad students to nib to pursue their further uh, curriculum so today my topic itself uh, you can see witnessing the molecular mechanisms of the livestock uh, reproductive process through multidimensional molecular image so usually uh, i'm going to talk mostly about uh, different kind of imaging techniques that's what uh, most of them uh, though we work with all the micro uh, i mean electron microscopy all those things but uh, professor lakshman as well as uh, nayar sir they are going to cover all those topics 
uh, for the students, probably I'll cover mostly microscopy, up to fluorescence microscopy. Maybe I'll touch on a little bit uh, structural illumination as well as single molecule microscopy, super resolution microscopy. So before I go into details, uh, let me say something like, uh, so the, the first image itself on the screen, you can see, this is a beautiful like a circular image. There are a lot of green stuff, holes like stuffs are there in between some reds are there. So this is a beautiful image captured by one of my PhD students, current PhD student, uh, Mr. Rohit. So, uh, I mean, this looks like fantastic, like some pomegranate kind of seed inside you have uh, pomegranate, everything. So, uh, so this is basically a fetal ovary of the pig. This is a fetal ovary of the pig. These all green circles are Follicles, that's what we call, they are the germ cells. The marker, it's a green marker, is, uh, which is the germ cell marker. And each hole, each circle indicates one germ cell, that is one oocyte, right? So you can see here a lot of oocytes as the clusters later uh, near the cortex region, later you go into a little bit deeper, they'll be little bit, they come out of the cluster, they'll become individual oocytes. So, this is the, I mean, if anybody has the question, like what is this exactly, why did I kept on the top of the uh, first slide? So this is the pig petal ovary, okay? So if anybody have any questions during my talk or during my training session, uh, you can unmute yourself. Uh, you can ask me right away any question you have, don't hesitate. Or uh, you can throw your uh, questions in message box, probably Dr. Tom, uh, Thomas can ask me directly reading those uh, questions, right? So next, uh, okay, uh, let's go to NIAB. So you can see here, NIAB, it's a beautiful campus. NIAB, we are, uh, uh, we are an autonomous institute of Department of Biotechnology. So you can see here, uh, recently we got this in 2018, uh, Dr. Harshavardhan, he has opened this campus. Uh, uh, you can see all over the, like this campus itself, we have a lot of departments and on the top of the hill, we have the large animal facility and be behind this, we have small animal facility and all other laboratories are there, very high end laboratories are there. So particularly for the national and international students, so we offer usually PhD courses. Uh, this is the old one, uh, the campus we usually ask for interviews. Uh, so we go with, uh, if the person has either CSR JRF or uh, maybe DBT JRF, ICMR JRF, all these JRF we entertain. So we have our research themes are, you can see here, right from nanotechnology, bioinformatics, reproductive biotechnology, gene and protein engineering, next generation vaccines and uh, diagnostics, host pathogen interactions, nutrition and metabolism, metabolic disorders, genetics and genomics, transgenic technology, uh, particularly now we are working more about uh, genosis as well as One Health. So the facilities include, we have almost like 18 to 20 scientists. They are internationally, globally competent faculty and we do have all the facilities including uh, whatever we call the so-called fancy uh, uh, techniques such as proteomics for mass spec, uh, super resolution, single molecule imaging microscopy, and transmission electron microscopy, scanning electron microscopy, live animal imagers we have. So we are very good enriched. And on the top, if you can see here, uh, like we are very nearby, uh, TAFR as well as IIT Hyderabad as well as IIIT. We are all together and TAFR. We are as a cluster. You can see, um, as a cluster, you can see here, this is our NIAB located. University of Hyderabad is very nearby, side of us. Whereas this is the Q, Q city and a little bit far away, we have CDFD city. We are all together as a cluster. So what I mean to say here, if someone comes with a scientific question, we have a very good cluster. We can share everything with other campuses and other students or other faculty. So we can solve the question in an individual or different manners or by approaching in a multi-directional orientation. So I, most of the students who are participants are maybe international students. We welcome to NIAB and please look at our website. If you have any questions right away, you can directly post a question to me. I'd be happy to answer you. 
and we do offer uh, PhD courses, please uh, do look at our website. Okay, that is our uh, that is our about NIAB, right? I don't want to kill a lot of time in this. Next. So uh, we are going at NIAB. This is my own advertisement for you guys again, for everybody, including all the veterinarians. We have hands-on training at NIAB. It's coming in May or June, 2021. It's, uh, I mean, we are waiting. It, it has been sanctioned uh, by around February, but we couldn't do because of this pandemic situation. So this is sponsored completely by SER. Uh, all over India, this is a national level workshop. We are going to choose 25 best students and we are going to give uh, particularly ultra-structural imaging and its applications in livestock research. It would be, it would be there on uh, May or June 2021. So uh, please look at our website for that particular advertisement, right? So now uh, let's go towards um, the today's training program. Uh, so uh, the, basically today, what I'm going to do, I'm going to cover to microscopic systems, microscopy. Uh, it's been a long time I have been working uh, all the big super resolution and uh, live cell imaging microscopes. So I'll give you a very brief, like maybe I'll cover 20 to 30 minutes on that. Exactly the basics, fundamentals of the microscopy. So what exactly microscopy means and how you're going to, what are the important things you have to look after microscopy, all these things. Then after like maybe 30 or 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes, I'm going to uh, definitely, I'm going to make, uh, I'll make sure like you will witness the reproductive processes of the livestock uh, reproductive processes. So let's start from the beginning thing. I mean, again, I'm, I'm telling openly, if anybody has any question, please unmute yourself. You can ask me question at any time, no problem. Or you can send your message to Dr. Thomer and uh, he will uh, he can directly ask the question. So uh, to, uh, uh, let's start with microscope. What is microscope? I mean, as everybody knows since a long time, uh, the microscope is a, Lot of people it's been a long time it's a laboratory instrument uh, used to examine objects that are uh, that are kind of small we cannot they are not visible with that so in other words what we can say this is an imaging system which provides the magnification so this is a simple wikipedia or encyclopedia image where you can see this is an imaging system where it provides the magnification. For example, you have an image of, uh, you can take it a, for example, one. If you use a particular objective or maybe kind of mirror, you can magnify 10 times by that. So you can see a bigger image with your eyes 10 times. So that is the basic uh, fundamental thing of the microscopy. And it gives you kind of freedom to, uh, from a uh, smaller room, where you cannot see with the naked eye. Uh, previously, we used to say this one is uh, absolutely a laboratory kind of uh, laboratory equipment, but right now it's no more laboratory equipment. So the now current uh, next generation and people are working with very few new microscopes. They like they will be tagged with iPhones. They will be tagged with mobile phones. You can take it to anywhere, you can do, you can see whatever you like. So th this is all upgrading. So the next generation microscopes are all over the world. They're coming very fast, particularly India also playing very big role. Like from DBT also, we are giving uh, like $1, like one rupee, I mean 30 rupees, 20 rupees microscopes for the school kids. There are a lot of programs are there. So then, uh, uh, let's go to, my, before we start into microscope, exactly what are the things required for microscopy? So if you ask really, what do you need for microscopy? Usually when you work with microscopy, you need a light. So without a light, you cannot see anything. So what is light? So as I have mentioned, light is electromagnetic radiation, which is usually described as a light. Uh, this will be in different spectrums of uh, radiation of wavelengths between 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. So as you see, when you change the spectrum, uh, completely it changes. So there are different basic properties are there for the light. Uh, those properties here I have mentioned, but one is intensity, which is related to the perception of the brightness, where you increase the brightness, you can see much better signals, much better image. Then the frequency, exactly what frequency you want to see, 
what wavelength you want to see, what color you want to see, then the polarization. Polarization, usually, most of you guys, you might have learned in your school, like, uh, you know, angle and vibration of the lights, incidence, ray of incidence. So these are very important. These are the basic properties of the uh, light, which are used in the microscope. So when we talk about the light polarization, particularly, you might have heard or maybe read in your physics in school books, whenever you have an incident ray, the incident ray, when you hit at the mirror, so you can see here in the red line, the angle of incidence, then once you hit it, then it will reflect. So the basic fundamental principle here the angle of incidence is equals to angle of reflectance. That's what. So then the other important property of the light, when you talk about a light, uh, you, light will be in different, I mean, multiple color. You will get it in multiple colors when you are going to the different nanometers. So um, let me see. So, so what we use in the microscopes basically because there will be different colors will be there uh, throughout the light. So they, they emit different colors. Like for example, you will have a red color, blue color, green color, yellow color. So different colors will be there. So in microscopy, what we do usually, we use a filters, particular filters. Here I have used the red filter so that you can only get the red light. Or here I have used the magenta filter. So here only you get the magenta color. So that means the filters plays very, very important role in microscopy. So then theoretically, if you talk about microscopy, as I said before, I've shown you a Wikipedia image where it shows a simple, uh, like this microscope, but how does it work basically? If you look at the theoretical microscopy, the microscopy is nothing but an array of lenses. You can see here, this is a focal plane. This is one objective lens. You will have tube lens and you will have an image plane. Here you will have eyepiece lens. Finally, you will get it into the, uh, your eyes as well as you can uh, go and collect that particular image at the microscope, right? The, the, that means it, this is microscopy is nothing but a series array of lenses where you can extend or where, where you can amplify the image several folds using these array of lenses, whatever those lenses I have shown you here, right? So when we talk about microscopies, there are, uh, there are different, uh, when you use the lenses, array of lenses, the focal plane system is very important. So when you talk about the focal plane system, there are two fo focal plane systems are there. So those two focal planes, what one we call, this is finite conjugate focal plane system. Then the second one is, this one is infinite fo focal conjugate system. What do you mean by focal con finite, finite conjugate system? So here, for example, uh, I'll use my pen to show you, right? This is the objective, right? And you will hit the light like this. Once you hit the light, just now I told you, angle of reflection will be there. Then the light passed through it. Then you will have a particular lens will be there and which will cover, finally, you will get the image at the eye. So how we calculate this one? This particular one, F1, we call it F1, and this is F2. So when you calculate the velocity, U is equals to where you can combine F1 plus F2. This is a finite conjugate system where the magnification efficiency or passing of particular image will be very less. But nowadays we need bigger level of system where we call most of the microscopes are infinite conjugate system. So infinite conjugation, whatever I told you here, here, sorry, this one is U and V. One by F, focal length is equal to U plus V. One by U plus one by U, V, you will get a focal length. At the same time here, when you get it, you will have here F1, this is one and F2, and you can have like that multiple kind of lenses. So this is called infinite focal planes. So wherever you have a sample is there, you will pass through light. Then this is the working distance you will have. You will objective, you will be, will be there. Objective again, will have a series of lenses. 
then again you will have a tubulance. This is what you call tubulance. Then this is the focal length in between the tubulance. Finally, you will have eyepiece. So this system is called infinite focal system. In the infinite focal system, you will get much better images. You can see the magnification. Here the magnification is very less. Here you will see several folds of magnification. That is, so that's why nowadays most of the common magnification systems are infinite magnification system. So next, when we talk about the, after we finish the magnification system, what is the important system? Because the series of lenses will be there in the objective. So the objectives are very, very important for the microscope. So here I have shown you two objectives. One, both are from different companies, like I can show you. This is from Nikon, this is also from Nikon. Uh, these are 60x, you can see, this is the 60x. This is the image magnification, as you see here, 60x. And there are very important things you have, whenever you're going to work on a microscope, you have to understand about your objective. So if you see here, here is the, what is this? Infinite is there. So just now I told you, there are finite as well as infinite. There are two focal lenses. So this infinity indicates the infinite focal length system, right? And uh, then uh, you can see here this like plan apochromate. So plan apochromate means, uh, okay, there are no, I mean, this particular object, uh, objective is uh, uh, made it error-free that using this apo system. So there, is, there will be a lot of chromatic aberrations will be there. If you use a non-plan apo, simple uh, objective, so you will have a lot of errors. Those errors can be uh, hindered by this plan apo system. This, that's what right here, aberration of the correction you can see here, right? Then uh, Dick is, uh, forget about that, I'll tell you later. This is a specialized optical property. When I talk, uh, deal with some images, then I can show you. Then as I mentioned here, uh, this 0.15, this is a working distance. As you see here, this objective is for wild field. Or working distance means it is the distance between your sample as well as your objective, right? Then, as, as I mentioned here, this one you can see 0.11 to 0.22. This is the tube length. Infinite system with the tube length. After that, this 0.11 to 22, it indicates the cover slip thickness. Whenever you're trying to image any kind of sample, there are a lot of parameters you have to think about it. One is the thickness of your slide and thickness of the cover slips, thickness of the sample, as well as light intensity, then your objective lens and where you're going to capture the image. That means the imaging system also very, very important. And finally, you can see here, here also it indicates the cover glass adjustment, gauge adjustment. This is the color correction. Whenever this objective will be there, whenever you turn it, so you can rotate here and there a little bit of the objective lenses. Based on that, you can do the color correction, right? So that's, this is what your all your friend, this is the friend which is required for your day-to-day -day jobs. And it plays very, very important role before you sit onto the microscope, make sure whether it's a, a simple compound microscope, whether it's a fluorescent microscope, whether it's a single molecule imaging, whether it's a turf, whether it's a structural illumination microscope, it doesn't matter. Objective is objective, right? So you have to understand the basic properties of objectives. All right. So next, so when you look at the objective, there is, people will say, this is, you see, this is 0.95, or you can see 1.4. What here I have mentioned is numerical aperture. So what do you mean by numerical aperture? Why it is required? Why you have to focus on the numerical aperture? You see here, numerical aperture is, this is your glass slide, right? This is your cover glass, where you will pass your light like this. Then this is your objective lens. So in between, you have a space will be there. If you have an air space, then the N will be one. So the basically NA is to estimate how much light from the sample is collected to the objective lens. That's what, because in between to travel, you have a lot of spaces there. So that play, that particular space, whenever you go for, uh, hit a light, you, uh, you will come up with the next level of light, uh, the ray, rays will come. They will go like this, right? Different data.
directions. How they are going, how your object, they're going to the objective lens, that's what importance. If it is an A, the N will be one, so that you can have a lot of divergence. So whenever we talk about the race, the basic properties, divergence, as well as convergence, usually they will diverge and they will converge like this. You have to understand these when you use the microscope, right? So whenever you use the air, you will have a lot of divergence. Whenever you have oil, so that most of the diverged rays, they can come into the, in a single way. So that's why here you will have N is 1.5. Whereas other than that, where cover slip, it also covers a little bit. It has 1.5 as well as glass slide is 1.5. Total together, the rays you are getting, you think it is alpha one and alpha two, so the N in numerical aperture gives N particularly, N is, if it is air, N is one. If it is a oil, N is 1.5. If, uh, if it is a water immersion, it will be 1.2 or 1.3. Then N multiplied with sine alpha, the rays you are getting. So this gives a complete picture of N. -A. So N is refractive index here and other alpha is angle of incidence of illumination. Then you can ask me, you're telling everything. What does this NA gives me? Well, so NA definitely, as much as your high is your NA, you will get that much of the good quality image. So your resolution will increase. So that's what, if NA is low, your resolution will be less. That's what, if you go here, let me go back to the slide. Here, the NA is 0.95. That means this particular object to resolution is poor. I, I don't say it's poor. It's not as much as better as compared to 1.4. So if you look at the most of the current generations microscopies, either it's a fluorescence or it's a, uh, you can take it to go to the super resolution or you can go to the decolonization microscopy. Most of them have, they should have 1.4 as a oil immersion object too. They, they will have a wonderful um, resolution efficiency, right? And currently, a lot of companies like JS or a few other Nano Oxford, they are coming up with 1.5 NA, 1.55 NA for much better resolution. So that means the, the bigger NA is, the better resolution you get. So that means NA plays a very, very important role. You might, probably you might have understood how to calculate the NA, what is exactly NA means, right? So if you have, again, I'm telling you, uh, don't go blindly. Most of the students are PhD scholars or postdocs. Don't worry. If you have any question, just throw it to me. I'm, I'll be very happy to help you, right? So these are the important things you have to understand on the microscope when you work any kind of microscope. Right. So next, a little bit. So right now I have covered what is the light and what you need, what is the object to, or, or on the object to what will be there. Next, a well, uh, little bit, we'll shift a little bit towards the fluorescence. Today, I'm going to teach a little bit more about fluorescence microscopy. So how does the fluorescence works? So the basic principle of fluorescence people has to understand because without the fluorescence, you know. So how does the, probably uh, most of the master students, maybe postdocs, undergrads, they should, this is the one which drives the fluorescence. So what is this? Jablonski diagram. So Jablonski diagram, what it indicates, particularly if you read little bit physics, whenever you excite any with a light source, anything, whatever the electron goes here and they go to the excitation stage and they will spin like this and they will come down to zero level stage at the emitting fluorescence, right? So that's what the Jablonski diagram indicates, like, while spinning, while coming back to the natural zero level, while spinning, you will emit some photons. Those photons you are going to collect and you are going to make it as a picture on your screen. It's very simple, right? The same as the eye. Light exits and it emits, you will have a spinning of those electrons. They will, before they hit the ground state, they're a little bit faster and you can see as an image, those photons can be collected and much together and put it as an image. That's what all about this fluorescence, right? Whereas, for example, in phosphorescence, the technique is say, but the spinning of those particular molecules, the electrons, they will come, they'll be faster. So the fluorescence is in a different way you collect it. 
So same way, when you look at the probably uh, people you may know, a lot of people you may know, whenever you excite the fluorescent molecule that emits. So this is the excitation, this is the emission. So this is what we call this is anybody's know this, what is this? This is called stark shift. This is very, very important. This is what we call stark shift. How the wavelength shift of the, from one state to other state. For example, here, this is a fluorescent. When you hit with a particular sample, if this 490 blue light, what you are going to get because of the shift, 520 as a green light. For example, when you hit with a rod, shift will be there. For example, when you hit with a, I mean, usually you, this is a hex. Usually uh, you hit with a blue, uh, this is the color UV at 345, you will end up with a blue color. So what is this? This is hex. Usually hex stains the DNA. DNA will be, I mean, you can, the, whatever the ultimate color you get in the blue color, whether it's a hex, probably a lot of people may know with the others, other, other one DNA staining dye, which is called DAPI. DAPI is very well known dye, okay? This is the basic fundamental principle of microscope, right? So same one, this is what I have mentioned. So if you look at the fluorescence microscope, as I mentioned here, you have a sample here and you have a objective lens here. This is your LED light source. So here what you will have, you will have a filter. For example, whenever your light rays are passing, you will have a multiple colors. But for example, here I want to hit with a red light. What I have to use here? Red filter. So that only red gray can be passed. And here you will have a dichroic mirror. Then dichroic mirror will divert and it will hit the sample. Then finally the reflection light will become here and it will emit. And finally it comes through either your eye are your detection system where you can get the images like this, right? This is a simple basic fluorescent microscope where you can. So this, uh, this particular image I have already mentioned in which what light, fluorophore, how to hit it and this is the shift stark, stark, uh, stark shift I have mentioned it, right? And then when, when we go to this uh, from, for example, just now, the, that's the basic fluorescence. What is the difference between basic fluorescent microscope, what you use regularly, to the confocal? Confocal is nothing but it's a, it's one more kind of, some kind of, maybe you made a, uh, for example, um, you take some, uh, any kind of uh, uh, particular line, you make a particular cross in that. If you make a straight line like that, it will be straight dash. If you make a, like a vertical line like that, it will become a plus sign. So similar way, where this fluorescent microscope will be there, you use a little bit high-end equipment and you, use, you hit with the laser rays or maybe you hit with uh, different high-end uh, rays and uh, you use some particular technique where you can see better image. That's where it becomes confocal. So what is the basic uh, fundamentals in the confocal? So whenever you have a specimen here, you can see here and in the confocal basically, we use a particular word which is called pinhole. So the light which will be passed through a pinhole, in here you can see, the pinhole aperture will be there, fluorescence barrier filter which will be through a pinhole, and uh, uh, excitation lens, you can see the this one, light source also pin. So most of them, they're going through a pinholes. Whenever, for example, you are throwing some uh, uh, light like this from your laser source, then it will go through a pinhole. So what happens once the diverse light, here it will get converted, it will go a focus more, then again it will diverse, it will hit a dichroic mirror and it will go to the objective, it will hit the specimen at a particular focal plane. You can see this is the top focal plane, this is the middle focal plane, this is the end focal plane, at different focal planes. So what happens? The sample where you are hitting, that will be very specific at a single point. Then, it will come back. Finally, it will go through a barrier, again, a kind of pinhole barrier. It will go to the pinhole aperture where it will go to the detector. Here you can detect very simply. 
there is no big uh, kind of rocket science uh, is there there is no big rocket science is there uh, particularly when you compare with uh, fluorescence microscope to the uh, i'll say like uh, confocal imaging or maybe spinning disk almost they are same only what you are going to change you are going to change the light source definitely yes because you need high laser power like for example if you ask a kid to kick give a kick the power energy will be less but if you ask me to kick you the power energy will be more so i mean much better you will move same way you will much better way you will excite your sample so that's that's the fundamental thing then the light source how you are after the light source how you are sending that's also plays very critical role and once you getting how exactly you are pinning at a particular sam a particular sample you are focusing that plays a critical role and on the top your detector system whether it is ccd camera and cmos camera it will uh, it will it will play a, uh, a very important role so just give me a pause hello hello yep call me later please so um uh, uh sorry for the disturbance uh, so now it's a similar kind of model system where you have uh, uh, similar to uh, uh, you have a pin hole here here you have a सिंगल single pin holes will be there but here what happens you have a micro arrays lenses of micro arrays will be there lenses of the disk will be there these disk continuously they spin rotate like this so whenever you 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 send a like filter all the filter through the filter barrier light will goes to there and you will have a pin hole will be there through the pin holes light will be passed and they will in a particular object too it will go to the individual points of the in a particular uh, plane of that uh, specific uh, i can say slide so then after that it will reflect and it will get back to you and finally you will get it as image so what i mean to say here particularly in fluorescence microscopy it's a matter of technique what kind of uh, instrument or what kind of uh, particular part you are going to use that completely dictates the quality of the image right then when we talk about i have given you a little bit about objective system how the light goes what is the fluorescence microscopy how the confocal works how the uh, i mean spinning disk works then finally the important thing although you have used pin holes like just make it you have 1000 pin holes or 10000 pin holes or maybe you have used 5000 uh, like particularly diode kind of systems you are not going to get a, you may get a best system for your visibility but how you are going to get into Uh, to show someone you cannot uh, ask everybody to come to the microscope and show the image that's absolutely not right so at the end of the day you have to convert into the saveable image you have to save it you have to note it down whether it's a micro uh, i mean computer based some hardware or somewhere for that you have to capture image while capturing what you need you need a photo detectors they have to detect the particular image and they have to amplify them you get it so what are these photo det detectors these are the optical receivers that means optical signals which get the light though that light will be transferred into electrical signal such as current or voltage finally they will give a particular image so that's why we call these guys are oe converters so these photo detectors are receivers amplify the signal and finally they will and after amplifying all the photons will be collected and you will throw it as a single image when we look at the photo detectors there are different types of photo detectors sir this is this is very important to understand for example you are sitting on a microscope what camera you are using are you using a ccd camera that means what kind of photo detectors it has 
are you using a uh, i mean uh, cmos camera what kind of photo detectors are there? and what is the efficiency you get from there so uh, i told you these photo detectors are different photo detectors sir those photo detectors there are one is single point detectors the second one is multi point detector so when we talk about single point detector so what happens uh, you might have uh, heard about uh, old dianodes for example speaker systems if anybody get married or something they used to put a amplifier uh, connected to your tape recorder and they will blow up a big volume so this is a similar kind of strategy what will happens you are here you will have a photo cathode will be there and you are focusing electrode will be there what happens whenever you hit a sample your electrons once you hit they will convert it into photons again they will come and hit at the photo cathode and they will get these guys will get converted into electrons you can see here these from one to other this is the first multiplication this is the single point you collect then 2 to 4 4 to 8 dianodes will be there they will amplify so that's why this tube itself we call it as a photo multiplier tube it will multiplies and finally you will get a image as a constructed image but the, 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 this is very old model system still people are using in different way for example our uh, uh, internet cables some of the cables still uh, these kind of techniques are using so but the problem is the quantum efficiency is poor where this quantum efficiency which we call uh we call it as a qe when we talk about microscope you go to a person ask him what is the qe of qe of this particular imaging system they will say it should be 70 70% they should say like it should be 80% so mostly the current microscopes fluorescence what you use the q i mean qe will be around 80% or maybe sometimes if, if the uh, new model one day go maximum to 80% quantum efficiency means number of photons you are getting you are con converting into electrons and you are giving is a, a much better bigger image in a good way so that means these single point detectors like uh, photo diodes these are very poor so you if you use them definitely you will end up with a very poor image right uh, next these are the multi point detectors these multi point detectors have a numerical you will have anodes will be there whenever your light signal passes so what happens your light goes all of them they collect in a multiple channels they will convert into single image finally you will get it for example current existing cameras you can see most of the cameras this is the microscope camera here i have shown but your current whatever you use your in hand camera also that's also it's with a multi point detector right so within these multi point detectors in current generation we are using two very very important cameras which we call one is cmos camera this is very important to understand in your microscopy because this most of the microscopes at the current generation they come up with a cmos camera so cmos cameras they will have a specific metal oxide there will be semiconductors will be there what happens whenever your photons come and hit them they collect all of them together i mean in a together they will amplify you will have a amplifier column will be there again they will convert into photons uh, photons convert into electrons you will have a receiver will be there finally it will convert into it will give a Im image output like this so this is the cmos camera what we call so this is a metal oxide semiconductors will be there cmos cameras are very good they give qe at least nowadays what we are getting around 85% qe that means best images but the resolution efficiency will be less the, for, to increase the resolutions what we do we usually use ccd cameras ccd are called charge coupled devices what happens here same technique is same photon to electron conversion finally you miss but it will hit at a particular place not like all of them together then individually it will collect so that the image resolution will be much better so what happens the best example if you use a simple fluorescence microscope you will use a cmos camera that is very good but if you are using super resolution single molecule resolution people will go for ccd camera that is the this is slow and precise this is fast and very noisy you get lot of noise because you are collecting lot of signals at a time right right 
this is all about your microscopy then next comes you are going for microscopy because this is a kind of workshop kind of stuff so you have to understand how to choose what microscope i have to use for example if you come to nid i'll tell you the list of microscopes what we have we have right from what we call the compound microscopes or maybe simple upright microscope then uh, uh, fluorescent microscope then we have separate microscope only for live cell imaging then we have confocal microscope then we have sim structured illumination microscope then we have single molecule resolution microscope then others like ultron microscopes and uh, tems and both they i'll put them in a different category so once you enter into a particular uh, image facility you have to understand i have my sample uh, which microscope should i use that's what the basic question one should get as a student or maybe postdoc or phd guy whoever it may be so that means what kind of then the question comes what kind of biological question you are going to answer that is a very important thing what kind of images you need what kind of infrastructure you have how to analyze the image what kind of samples you are processing and the quantification right so for example what kind of biological question you have someone just want to see a mammalian cell do you need a fluorescent microscope absolutely no just you go for bright field image you take a picture and you will get a cell you don't need a fluorescent microscope that kind of bright field micro you will get day to day everywhere every lab usually see similarly for example you have a particular cell or you have a particular protein which is tagged with gfp so what you need in that case you need a fluorescent microscope for example then the next question comes are you doing a direct fluorescence or indirect fluorescence when you talk about direct fluorescence some protein you have tagged with a gfp you have to observe under microscope in a live cell so that means you have to directly get the dynamics of that particular protein whereas indirect immunofluorescence what you do you have a particular protein which is tagged with for example i have a protein p i have tagged with a epitope uh, you can take it as a flag tag his tag or any tag this epitope i will use the primary antibody against to this then to this i will use secondary antibody then i will get the image right so what you, this is a indirect microscope indirect immunofluorescence so what you need in this case here also you need fluorescence microscopy but you don't need to get as a live cell imaging where you go for time lapse where you have to stabilize the sample where you need a uh, environment should be within the temperature like 37 degrees or maybe 35 degrees for different reasons right so similarly you have to understand what question i am going to ask what question what biological question then the the next one you have to images you need what kind of images are do you need the images just for quantification are do you need the images to show it to the public publication quality or for example you have a protein a here and you have a protein b here you want to know whether they colocalize or not how do you know you go to the under microscopy if you use a simple fluorescence microscopy you will get a single line but if you go to a super resolution or structured illumination these two lines you will get into separate lines so that what you will come to know whether you will come to know the colocalization doesn't mean in the fluorescence that means they are interacting if they are not colocalized also you cannot say anything only you will come to know whenever you are going for a high end super resolution where you see a two lines also they are coming together 25% colocalization 50% on top or side by so this is what you need then the next question your infrastructure for example you want to use a microscope where you want to use a colocalization to see a single molecule so is it is it good to where in your microscope facility you don't have a infrastructure you have only compound microscope you cannot do that so you have to ask a particular person particular facility then analyzing the image what kind of once you get the image what you need you have a two lines you want to know the distance between two proteins right so you need a software based technique to analyze then finally quantification right these are the very important things to uh, keep it in your brain when you go for microscopy okay so next choosing the light source what kind of light you need just now i told you just you want to measure a cell i mean just you want to observe a mammalian cell you take any cell 
simple cell or you take anything bacteria anything just you want to look at them why you need fluorescence you go to transmitted light so the question, you have to understand what you have what sources you have what you have but the, here i'm telling you what are the advantages transmitted light good for measuring the cell behavior no special preparation is required no molecular biology or genetics they are simple lights less damaging long term time lapse you can do whereas fluorescence good for measuring the molecular behavior particularly molecules which can you can do indirect or direct immunofluorescence but they will damage your specific cell and the long term time lapse is not possible because the word comes into the quenching that means you will lose the light intensity right and you need very special preparation that's what i was keep on telling you need a primary antibody secondary antibody or you have to tag your protein with either gfp yfp rfp or anything so this is a little bit complicated here i have shown you two images uh, you so you just look at it okay all right this is the time lapse video imaging of the scratching you have a scratch while healing you can see this is the scratch we we have taken this image the cells when we pull how they heal how they come and how they close the particular scratch a wound same way like this here you can see here a particular this is a oocyte after fertilization you can see the how the embryo particular different stages of the embryo so you can see one cell to two cell two cell to four cell four to 16 16 to 32 like modula and blastula kind of you can see here the uh, the stages different stages so what do you need for this you don't need any kind of fluorescent microscope simple bright field is more than enough but next i want to ask a question how the cell divides i want to see the dynamics of the cell division you can see here these are the microtubules you can see they are coming you see here see here microtubules are coming they are dividing that means there is a spindle division is there so you will have a spindle microtubules will be there and they will divide right so here i have shown you a particular yeast cell uh, where we want to see the nuclear envelope dynamics we have tagged with one particular protein with gfp you can see their dynamics how they are moving look at that how fast that protein is coming to the cytoplasm and going back coming back going back so in this case what you need a microscope which can facilitate you want to see the live cell dynamics what you want in here a microscope which facilitates your live cell dynamics live cell imaging that means you have to control the environment temperature of the cell you have to control the light you have to control the focusing system it has to be in a single plane always then multi this probably i have taken this one for uh, i would say 10 to 15 minutes so uh, in between someone can walk, someone may walk around uh, that system uh, in between cell may move a little bit here and there because wind all these things so you have to maintain all these things so that's why it is very important to remember all right why am not moving next slide Pardon, uh, just give me one minute because my cursor was stuck. I'm not moving. Okay, go to mouse. Okay, yes. Right. Uh, when we go to this uh, epifluorescence, uh, in within uh, fluorescence, I told you there are several uh, different versions are there. epifluorescence which is low cost low cost by most cursor just bear for me and bear for a minute 
I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you because I need a cursor to show you. I've lost my cursor somewhere. I'm getting the mouse, but... Anyways, so uh, what, when, when you go for a simple epifluorescence, what is the use? This is a low cost, easy to use, lower, to, uh, lower signal to background noise, more damaging to live cells, and out of focus fluorescence. This is simple fluorescence. But when we go to the high end, you can see here, this is the deconvolution microscopy, where we use, you take a simple uh, wide field image, and using a particular software base, you deconvolve that image, you can see the cl clarity. I'm not getting cursor. Yes. Yeah. So you can see this is a wide field image. After the wide field image, when we go to deconvolution, what we do, deconvolution basically requires the G stacks. For example, your sample is thick, thickness is 5 micron. On the top layer, you may have something. In the middle layer, you may have something. In the bottom layer, you may have something. What we'll use? We'll use a technique which is called deconvolution. We'll run it. Similar way, this will be very useful. Similar, you can see here, this is a laser-based technique. We call it TARF. You can see much better signal to intense. This is a simple versus completely TARF microscopy. So the TARF microscopy currently we use, this is called portal internal reflection microscopy. Where you will have a, this is what the area we call, this is the evanescent field. So evanescent field, we call this field is the evanescent field. In this evanescent field, we'll collect the rays so that you can get right away as it is a simple rays and that evanescent being excited pose, we can collect it through a very good uh, uh, detection system and we can generate a very good image. I will show you the... And other than that, recently what we are using, which we call, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a new end microscopy, uh, we call light sheet microscopy. So what is the light sheet? For example, you want to uh, see a 3D structure of complete organ. You can see when you excite, the light sheet will be, look at this, how the light is transferring. Whereas simple way, you hit from the bottom, you get the light, excitation, you get it. Whereas in the light sheet, your laser beam will be excited like this. Here I have shown you in much better way than so that you will have a complete structure of that particular organ. You can see the best images of light sheet. This is a zebra fish, uh, one of our collaborator long back. You can see the beautiful zebra fish images. And uh, you look at this. This is with the light sheet. Look at this beautiful lives and light sheet dynamics of that particular zebra fish and you, what we got. This is how you localize, how randomly they go, and you can completely analyze it, right? This is what. Then finally, I'll touch up a little bit before I go into, uh, I, I'll make you to view our livestock stuff. So this is a super resolution microscopy. Why we need a super resolution microscopy? When we go to the sim, uh, simple conventional microscope, the resolution will be 200 to 250 nanometers. The resolution is very less. But when we go to SIM, structured illumination microscope, 100 nanometers. When you go to STED, STROM, PALM, these we call a super resolution single molecule. The resolution will be, nowadays we are getting even 20 nanometers. But ultimately, you get a best resolution you can see here. Current at present, this is a cryo-EM, you will get two to four nanometers. That's the best resolution. So that's why when you want to see particular, as I said, like two foci, you want to see any two independent foci, when you go to, you finally ultimately go either palm or since cryo -EM, you have to use the gold particles labeling them, that will be very difficult. But with the fluorophores, stead storm palm can be done. So as I said, the structured illumination microscopy where you can see completely, there will be a sim. This is the sim pattern will be there. You will have a kind of sieve will be there. So this is the sieve. When the light passes, that sieve will move like that. The light and like the overflowing sieve will move. Then particularly, you will get a <coughs> um, single point light, light, whatever electrons you will get in the resolved form. If you compare with this is the wide field versus this is the sim. That's what. 
it gives a very good technique it gives a very good for example what we have generated you can see these are all our own images if you see here these particular images this is a, uh, i'll tell you later what are these red lines so these are the basically chromosomes chromosomes of mouse and you can see the same chromosomes when we go using a sim here you can see a single line this is a simple wide field your fluorescent microscope but when we go to the sim these two lines are separated in between you have this green foci it looks like a single one but here this green foci in between two rail roads that's what the beauty of sim you can see here they are completely two lines this is what the sim gives you then finally the high end currently what we are using the microscope what we call this is a star this is a optical reconstitution microscopy where till now what are we doing we are sending the light and we are taking the light in a but here what we are going to do the molecules here what we will do either whatever the tags we use either we switch on switch off tags or that what we call photo switchable tags so you have a sample whenever the uh, the light goes and hits then only it will go to the on one it goes in a minute in a second like matter of second it will go to the off on off on off like whenever you are passing the light you have your protein has a particular tag this on off on off like that finally you will collect all the on offs on offs you can convert into the final image this is very very interesting technique i'll show you the best this will be little bit hard to understand but uh, my my time is very less to explain you everything but if you read it little bit well you will come to know this is what the best image i can show you uh, this is keerthy prakash long back she has published this is a simple bright field image you see this red line it looks like a single red line but once you go to the storm you see with they are they became a two lines within the two lines they have a single single dots that means we can tell the how many molecules of proteins are there in each individual spot that's what the beauty so this is the chromosome the chromosome having two lines they are all individually labeled that's the beauty of this microscopy same way a lot of people might know what are the histones so this is the chromosome usually histones will be there as a loops you guys know histone octameric form all the histones will be there different different forms will be there you look at this this is a dna the histones everybody knows this is the old fundamental thing histones form a loops because you have a big chromatid it has to get folded so how it get folded it will form a stem loop structure you can see here this is the loop loop this is the stem you see the beautiful loop and again loop again loop that means it condenses if you look at that how the condensation occurs particularly h3k29 trimethylation how it localizes as a single dots at the condensation you compare this bright field images with this superposition this is beauty of the microscopy right so till now i mean i i i covered almost one and a half hour with only microscopy so i don't know but dr thomer how much time i can spend hello uh, sir you can continue sir how long it still we have 30 30 minutes sir we still okay. we have 30 okay. minutes wonderful wonderful so now we'll uh, rush into i'll rush into our own research what we do it nab and how we do so here what i've given witnessing the molecular mechanisms of live talk reproductive processes so this top image is this is the mark. just now i've shown you these are the chromosomes the mouse female chromosomes as you see here usually we get 20 homologs like this the 2n is 40 where you have this one is 20 homologs will be there these particular dots are recombination spots what we call i'll tell you what is this so my laboratory is currently focusing on because the one of the biggest problem in livestock is reproductive problems you can see here so that's why we are focused on reproduction so my laboratory basically interested in genetic and natural methods to increase the fertility lifespan sperm quality and novel biotechnological technological approaches like biosensors also we also work and uh, making animal models and treatments right so the, the, let me come to a question why what it means why i use the microscopy for example you see here in india we have almost like 28 goat breeds are there so uh, just i have shown you some of the goat breeds like jamuna pari or barbari or black bengal or mangoodnagar 
So 28 different road beads are there. All of them, they, they have the different letter size. For example, you see sometimes like a lot of people say that black Bengal is really prolific. What do you mean by prolific? If you look at the average letter size, this gives more number of kids per year compared to, for example, Jamnapari or Barbari. There is Mahbub Nagar also three to four kids. So that means, the, the, particularly these goat varieties are what we have here, they're capable to give the kids, but somehow we are not getting them. So there might be a lot of problems, right? From nutrition to physiology, everything will be there. But is there other really way we can target in a right way? That's what we are trying to do. So previously, long back, uh, this Hong, they have published in Nature Genetics. What they have shown, recombination. What they did simply, they have taken uh, blood samples of different aged women and how many kids they have, they have taken all of them. When they compared the recombination frequencies versus number of kids. You see here, the aged women here, particularly aged women who are giving the kids after 40 also, they have more number of recombination hotspots. So that's really interesting. That means what we can think, Recombination might buffer the fecundity or fertility particularly, we can say. Maybe in other sense, sometimes we can say even in prolificacy also recombination has the role. So that's why, so the question comes, where does the recombination occurs? So the recombination occurs in a meiosis process. Meiosis is the essence of heredity as you see here, male germline and female germline. They undergoes individually to meiosis. This is a reduction of segregation. Once they uh, become haploids, then you, you will get um, a sperm as well as uh, egg, then undergoes fertilization, then they will become uh, diploids, finally different into mitosis. Again, they will enter into the same circle, right? This is what all about meiosis. So when you see like you're getting half a character from mother, half the characters from father, but at the same time, if you look at your siblings, I don't look like my sister, you don't look my, like your brother, why? Because the basic reason is homologous recombination. That's what you got a recombination hotspot. So this particular recombination, these are the chromosomes as you see here. It starts with a double-stranded break. So what will happen? You will have a DNA. It will get breaks. Then once this pole 11 dependent breaks will be there. Once the pole 11 breaks, then you are both maternal and paternal comes together. They will undergo pairing. That's what you see the red line here. You can see. This structure, this zipper-like structure is the chromosome. Here you can see this. This indicates that this one, right? Once they come together, they will have a homology search. Then they will form a crossover, crossing over. They will exchange the DNA material. This, this green, green fossa is this one, right? Then finally, they will uh, go to the mono orientation. Then the sister gynetochores will pull backside like that. This bottom end cohesin will cleave and they will go to the opposite poles. Still, you will have a centromere cohesin will be there. Finally, at the meiosis two, you will have a second round of segregation. You will have a four haploids, right? This is all, all about meiosis, what you learned in your school books. In, for example, if you take in a male, whether it's animal or human, you will have a four sperm with a different rate combinations. You can see different combinations. That's why you look completely different. Whereas in female, you will have one and remaining you will lose as a polar body, right? Right, that's what. So this is what I've shown. I've, whatever I've shown you here, I've shown you as a images in microscopy. These guys are taken simple fluorescence microscopy as you see here. This stage DNA double strand break forms. We label with the gamma H2X green color. And here DMC1, RAD51, this is a DNA double strand strand invasion. Then once the strand in, once you have a break, this is uh, this homologous strand invade inside, then you will have a stringle strand invasion. Finally, you will have a double holiday junction. You will resolve and finally you will have a chaos matter. This is what the end product. There you will have this structure, right? All right. So now the question, initially what I said, these recombination frequencies are somehow uh, connected with fertility as well as fecundity, fecundity as well as prolificacy. But 
why basically why these varies how these varies that's what we want to question answer the question if we know the variation why they she is one lady has more one uh, lady has less to answer this what we have chose we have chosen a way which we call it is uh, in a evolutionary way evolutionary perspective we have taken so for that what we have chosen in the evolution is this is a million years ago you can see 0 to 75 100 million years you can see the how evolution occurs here gyrias very old one is chicken then mouse you can see here pig bull sheep goat so in the evolution the least evolved particularly related with recombination events and meiosis are goat and sheep so we have collected the testis samples then we have taken the samples and we have isolated the spermatocytes and we put it on the slides then we have labeled with syzp and mls3 mlh1 so syzp3 is nothing but as i said like there will be homologs will be the rail road zipper like structure will be there that structure is syzp3 and mlh1 which is the homologous recombination protein which is a resolvase if mlh1 is there means there the recombination occurs one fo focus means one recombination hotspot as you see here a uh, beautiful images this is by lava my phd student you can see syzp3 mlh1 we have done in mouse pig bull sheep and uh, whatever in you know, goat and if you look at the mlh1 chicken they have a lot of mlh1 you see here this one there is mouse only 20 there is pig bull sheep goat in uh, during the evolution the number of recombination events are increasing where the at the same time total number of chromosome lengths that means the chromosome axis lengths also increasing but the chromosome within the axis for example you have 10 cm of the chromosome out of that the distribution of these particular recombination events are there barely similar in all the animals that means there is some pseudo fixation there is no change that means the length should be regulated so the variation here i have one within this particular micron 1.5 or 2 micron i should have more during the evolution it is fixed but if you look at the average crossover numbers versus genome size it varies a lot you can see genome size versus like 1 2 3 gb or 4 gb goat is like 2 and they vary so we cannot make it but whereas per crossover per genome also increasing and crossover per homolog also increasing so what we understood from here the variation of these crossovers in higher order vertebrates in all livestock species basically the crossovers increases during the evolution it depends on the chromosome length as well as this is a persistent that means this is a constant the distribution between one crossover to other crossover it is constant right um, then we have looked at uh, how the dna recombination starts when we looked at as i said recombination starts with double strand break formation as you see here these are all single individual fossil look gives one double strand break you can see chicken mouse pig bull uh, if you look at these graphs very interesting the crossover number increases what we expect because crossovers comes from the double strand breaks but very negative correlation you can see here the double, double strand breaks are decreased that is very interesting we don't know why exactly whereas the crossover intermediate protein they stay stable then previously here our super resolution comes here previously what we have published a sumo which is in the male is localized to the axis you can see this green is chromosome and red is chromosome green is sumo foci and it localizes in the early prophase early meiosis later in the packetin you see all of them disappeared these these spots big spots we call their chromocenters that means these are centromeres they will form a cluster in a centromere and this big spot is called sex body usually you will have in males xy will be there this is a sex body but interestingly when we looked at the females same as this but the numbers increased but during late stage also you can see there on the axis so what we thought like that in the male versus female the recombination events also more we thought that sumo might be the major player which are increasing the recombination so as you see here here you go these are the super resolution images you can see the completely resolved in a two lines you can see the green also varying whereas in the females it's too much it's more 
right. You can see these graphs. Sumo in female is more as well as crossovers are more as well as chromosome length is more. That means sumo plays very important role. Then right away we ask what happens to our uh, evolution for sumo. As you see here, sumo chicken, pig, sheep, mouse, bull, goat. During the evolution, you can see, as I showed you before, in mouse, it has at the sex body as well as heterochromatin, chromocenters. But later in pig, little bit more on the axis, in bull, furthermore, in sheep, it completely became too much, in goats also too much. This indicates that there is a positive correlation between sumo with our uh, crossover events, right? So then how to confirm this? So I don't want to go into this. How does this sumo happens? Like usually sumo elation is the process. It's just like a ubiquitination process where sumo will get conjugated with uh, sumo one by different methods. E1, E2, E3 process will be there. Just look into it. So what we have done, for example, a protein target is there. So what here we want to check if we increase the sumo, whether the crossover numbers are increasing, whether the kids, the, that particular animal is getting more kids or not. If the sumo is decreased, the crossover numbers are decreasing or not. So this is what target protein is there. Sumo will be cut by SAMP1 as well as sumo2 is cut by SAMP1. So what we have done, this is the target protein wild type. That means it will have a regular sumo, whereas target protein, this is a sumo1 knockout where your crossover rate will be less possibly, but definitely sumo will be less. This is a hyposumo where, as I said before, this one, it cuts the SAMP1, right? SAMP1 cuts the sumos. If you knock out this SAMP1, you will have more sumos. So that's what, then you will have what we call this hypersumo. That means in one case, we are increasing sumo, in other case, we are decreasing sumo. Then the other one, it is a simple wild type, right? Then we asked, what happens to crossover rate, chromosome lines, and kids, litter size? As you see here, this is a wild type sumo. These are all mouse. We made a knockout mouse. I'm not going to tell you how we made the knockout and everything. That's a long story. These are all knockout mouse. This is a wild type. This is a hyposumo, where sumo is knockout. You see, absolutely clean. Whereas hypersumo, increased sumo. Hope you agree with me. This is increase, too much increase. Then we asked what happens to crossovers. You can see wild type, hypo crossovers are decreased, hyper crossovers are increased. That is wonderful. So that means right away here, you are getting right correlation. If you knock out the sumo, the crossovers are decreasing. If you, know, if you increase the sumo, the crossovers are increasing. That's beautiful, beautiful. Then the chromosome lengths are going in, increasing. That coincides, wonderful, right. So then we ask, is this increasing sumo is because increasing crossovers because of sumo? Then what we did, we have combined a double mutant sumo with sam. Then it came to the normal original way. So that means it's hundred percent clear that the correlation between crossovers and sumo is perfectly aligned. Then we asked, how exactly? Because you are increasing the chromosome lines, but your chromatin size is usually it should be same for every human being or every animal, it should be same. How do you know that? You guys might have heard as uh, uh, microscopic techniques, what we call fish, fluorescent in situ hybridization. So here we have used chromosome five fish. You can see this is the chromosome five. This green is the complete chromatin as a loops. You can see here loops. So what happened? You can see the chromosome size is decreased in hyposomal. But the loop sizes are increased, whereas hypersumo, the chromosome length is increased, but the loop size is decreased. So what does it indicate? Your chromosome length is, in, axis length is increasing, but whatever your DNA size, chromatin is either stretching, increasing the loop size or decreasing the loop size. So you are not hurting the chromatin. You are not doing anything. Only axis length is, axis length is changing. That's wonderful. So you are not doing any bad things with it. Finally, we have to show, we have shown that particular proteins undergo simulation in vitro, in vivo, not necessary right now. This is very important. The question comes into the mind. Yes, he has increased the sumo. What happens to the kids? That's what finally we have to see, prolificacy. This is the litter size. These are litter numbers. You can see 
particularly you can see you may know genetics usually we go with wild type wild type wild type heterozygous male wild type heterozygous female heterozygous with heterozygous look at this particular heterozygous of this particular samp1 and heterozygous of the female male all the times when you compare with wild type here you are getting average 6.5 or 5 kids but here always you are ending up 10 kids in mouse you are having almost 50% increase almost 5 kids or more this is wonderful right so now comes to the real story so what is it mean to how what does it mean to the livestock how you are going to further proceed as i told you before jamnapuri gives once a, once in a year and average one kid and barbari two kids black bengal mahbub nagar three four kids then throughout india we have collected the test samples and we have asked whether this kids percentage or litter litter size whether they correlates with the crossovers as you see we have done jamna pari i have shown you here chromosome these are the goat chromosomes you can see here long chromosomes and green ones are crossovers then you look at this the mahbub nagar goat it gives 3 to 4 kids the crossover numbers are around average is 70 whereas jamna pari which gives average one kid the crossover numbers are 55 so that means whatever we saw in the mouse it correlates here and it correlates with litter size then the next question as a researcher i would ask like is it then do we see big hype in our big hyper sumo in this there you go yes this is the jamna pari sumo as you see here this is the sex body the sumo is little bit here and there on the axis you can see the sumo is very less but if you look at the mahbub nagar sumo is hyper based on this what we propose basically if you increase the sumo chromosome axis size increases as well as crossover number increases there is a possibility of increasing the prolificacy at the level of litter size right right so dr thomar uh, do i have another 10 15 minutes or you want me to wind up uh, sir you can continue sir no issue with timing sir are the kids are okay or it's too much for them uh, i think they all are enjoying your session sir okay that's wonderful so now whatever i have shown you lava has shown wonderful data in males let's come into the females what kind of work we do we do wonderful work in females so one of my phd student rohit does this job he is wonderful so usually you should know all the girls who are sitting here they have to be very careful listen carefully this is for you guys only right look at this oocyte number this is humans basically non veterinarian uh, people like this is for you guys in humans usually oocyte numbers when you are usually males versus females i have to tell you the differences before i go to the uh, real talk males usually after birth when the male guy comes into the puberty then his testes from his testes every you can get lot of sperm continuously throughout his life but whereas female is not like that your oocyte number is initially the number will start for example you start with 8 million your number is fixed over there in your mother's womb only you will form your oocytes unlike males your oocytes will be formed when you are as a kid in your mother's womb when you come out these numbers slowly decreases when you go to the puberty stage after 15 years or maybe 14 puberty every month you will release a egg right that's what here this is almost 8 million numbers when you are in your mother's womb when you go to the birth around at the time of birth you can oh this is sorry this is complete so right now the female infertility problem is too much if you look at this graph age versus oocyte number usually females undergoes optimal fertility around 20 to 30 years then later around 30 to 40 years the female uh, fertility declines slowly around 40 years you will reach to threshold that's what we call it menopause they are completely you will have no more possibility to have a kid that's what the regular stuff so kids you have to understand your best time to have a kids 20 to 32 35 years better yes simultaneously with the research get married and have fun research as well as with kids i do recommend right so this is very important science along with kids it's more wonderful awesome uh next 
but if you look at that this female infant but at the current situation what what kind of troubles we are facing we are not getting jobs until 40 years we are not getting jobs until 35 years we look for individuality and look at the environment maybe 1940s environment is completely different and current now uh, hyderabad and uh, delhi like uh, metro cities they have too much pollution like you're highly i mean your environment is highly polluted so you're having everyday trouble you are you are all the body parts are undergoing kind of deterioration to be frankly so same way over here also undergoes it loses so if you look at that same as in cattle cattle also you can see reproductive lifespan uh, where they will go to the optimal fertility around maybe i would say 3.5 to 6 years will be 6.5 7 years optimal fertility will be there the fertility declines then undergoes end of the fertility around 10 years this is threshold but if you look at the Indian scenario, currently we have Indian uh, livestock census says 5.3 million of stray cattle. Do you know what you mean by stray cattle? Non-livestock people, they go around the roads and leave it separate. That's a, one of the biggest problems. 10 to 15 percent every year. The government of India, like UP governments, they are spending a lot of money on stray cattle. It's a huge thing. So, for example, uh, the it declines the fertility around nine to ten years if we can extend them for another two years two lactations that will give a huge benefit to the farmers right not only the cattle livestock within the livestock we have poultry industry where you see the eggs at the first year you will go to the hundred percent slowly around fifth year the egg laying efficiency will come down to 50 percent later they will go to the retirement stage that's what we call uh, there are several reasons that's with nutrition, calcifications. Then one more other reason is reduction of number of eggs within the follicle because when you are in the mother's womb or when you are in, in the baby stage, your number is fixed, not like male. You can produce continuously. This is a fixed number. If you are here, start with 1 million. At the end also, you have to utilize all the 1 million only. So this is a, one of the biggest problem in poultry. Right. How does this oocyte number reduces? You see here, I told you, in females, 8 million oocytes when you are in the mother's home, gustation, what we call. When it goes to the birth, 8 million comes to 1 million. You are losing 7 millions before birth when you are in the mother's home. But when you go to the menstruation or maybe puberty stage, this 1 million coming down to 300,000, just 300,000. When you go to the 40 or 35 manupas, there will be hardly 100. But in your lifetime, how many kids you give? Two. But why does the female become infertile, most of them, in the current situation? Because you don't have oocyte number, what we call them as oocyte reserves. They are continuously reducing in the natural process. On the top, you are putting environmental stuff, you are putting UV stress, you are putting your mental stress, you are putting hormonal stress, you are putting you, your food habits, no exercise for the females. The, I mean, I'm not blaming females for everybody. All the girls and guys, no one does the uh, exercise. These are all like matters lot for complete body, right? So this is how it reduces. Same as in cattle. You see, cattle starts with 3 million. And the, at the birth, they will come down to 1.1 million. Around uh, 7.5 retirement age, they will come down to 50 to 100. There is no more those can be. Uh, so, if you have an early resource, if you have more resource at early stage, later you can have a much better, you can extend them, right? Well, I'm coming to the first image what I've shown you. This is a beautiful pig ovary. So, what we are doing, we are trying to protect the oocytes in two strategies. One is, I'll show you total, how we can protect these eggs. The guys who are dying at the early stage when their mothers womb, these kind of stuff, right after birth, these are called around the releasing. Then the other guys who are dying at the later stage during the maturation, they are for different reasons they are dying. So what we are doing here, we are targeting the early stages as well as later stages, particular pathways to protect the egg in livestock and humans also. So for that, what we did, so early stages, in the other picture I have shown you, early stages, oocyte releasing requires a particular pathway. We call it is maturation pathway, which will be uh, modulated by mTORC, PI3 kinase, AKT. If you have more questions, please go to the textbook and read it. 
and the other pathway who said death pathway in the later stages what we called whether you have a dna repaired or non repaired or unknowingly they die where they will entertain this atr kinase atr kinase phosphorylates checks to down downstream most of you people know p53 which is the apoptotic protein but interestingly in females this is very interesting uh, you may never see these kind of strategies how beautiful is our body so in early stages when you are in the womb particularly females to kill the oocytes you will use p53 pathway but once you come out to the nature like out of birth you will suddenly shift to the p63 pathway which is the same similar sister of the p53 that's completely novel so this is uh, finally it ultimately send it to oocyte death so it's you see here why i'm telling you this is a beautiful mouse ovary mouse after birth this is see you see one day these are all single uh, circle indicates one egg with a red color is a p63 in early stages very few red colors are there but you see after birth around 5 days of mouse you can see lot of reds all of them that means p53 is shifting to p63 but p63 is shifting you are killing lot is there any dna damage in the oocyte you see here this is the dna or damage marker initially it has lot of dna damage but later there is no dna damage but oocyte doesn't know why they are dying so we have few hypotheses like one hypothesis is i have a dna damage and dying second hypothesis is i am not feeling unwell and dying third hypothesis is my friend is dying i will die and fourth hypothesis is we call it suicidal tendency i don't know i'm bored of all this lecture today i'm going to die i'm going to kill my oocytes this is what the oocyte does this is a wonderful phenomena in the animals you see how intelligent they are so then we asked is this particular phenomena is there in the livestock you can see this is a good wonderful ovary embryonic ovary they are maybe just i guess this is after birth at one day just after birth oh, this is a goat ovary this is a pig ovary this is a chicken ovary and we have looked into sheep ovaries they are they're wonderful even bovine right now we are looking you can see here because uh, mouse you could see complete ovary because mouse ovary is very small when you go to the large animals the ovaries are bigger right so you can see this is a very big so i cannot show you completely but each green individual green shots you can see green circle and red this is a p63 beautiful that means these mechanisms are conserved among hum uh, among mouse and livestock species also then we asked is the p53 is there this is a beautiful goat ovary you can see the circles they don't have p53 but there is p63 is there subsequently most of you guys you may know caspase 3 which is finally undergoes apoptosis caspase 3 is passed to that means in livestock species also these mechanisms are conserved so we can target them these guys to get a pro, to increase the lifespan of the fertility particularly in human beings as well as in the livestock so we have asked the question does pharmacological inhibition of these p63 or its uh, interacting pro partners protect the oocyte death or we can we increase the lifespan so what we did i'm going a little bit rushing up so we have chosen several compounds from the libraries and we what is our aim here we have to kill both the pathways one is releasing pathway which is mtorc pathway and other one is killing pathway which is p63 pathway using bioinformatics we have screened several compounds out of them i'm showing you few results so what we did to know we have taken a mouse here we have injected that compound around around 8 days after birth then at 15th or 20 days we have sacrificed then we asked for number of eggs you can see counts here you can see here control without any of that compound injection there are only few eggs are there but whereas drug you can see all are beautiful growing eggs at the same time releasing early stage eggs you can see there are lot numbers almost two fold increase is there that's wonderful so that means we are saving the eggs by targeting this pathway then the next question in our day to day life we undergo a lot of uv food we eat lot of bhajia oil food and everything there will be lot of mutagenesis occurs mutagen mutations occurs in the dna mutagenesis compounds will be there so what will happens they will chop your dna dna damage occurs so whether uh, are in other ways for example a women who is undergoing cancer therapy we call it radiotherapy or chemotherapy 
their whole body undergoes the radiations. So you will have a DNA damage. Can we rescue the fertility in those kind of situations? As you see here, we have taken a mouse at the particular stage, five days, and we have given a compound. With that, what we have given, you can you understand cisplatin? Cisplatin chops the DNA into pieces. It is a DNA damaging agent. Then control, control which has a DNA damaging agent, cisplatin as this is a simple PBD, PBS or something. Whereas in the drug with the DNA damage is still, you see, though you are giving DNA damage, still your oocytes are protected. So that means these molecules will be wonderful for the naturally going everyday exposing radiations, exposing women, or uh, I would say uh, women who are undergoing cancer therapies such as radiotherapies, these molecules could be a life savers. I don't say life savers, fertility savers for them. So this is the damage will. Uh, so usually whenever you have DNA damage, ATR comes, check to phosphorylex and P63 and oocyte undergoes death. But in our case, when we induce our compound, they are not dying. This is beautiful, right? So then we asked, why these guys are not dying? As you see here, P63 undergoes phosphorylation by check 2 because P63, it's not only there in the oocytes. It's there in the all other body cells also. If you give this dirt, it may target other body cells also. That's not good. So that's why we asked what happens to P63. As you see here, even though you are using drug, it's not inhibiting P63. All the P63 levels are normal. It's really surprising. Then we asked, is there any relation? Is there any problem with phosphorylation? As you see here, P63 here, the phosphorylation is uh, completely reduced with the inhibitor. Uh, here, in the control, you have a lot of phosphorylation. That's why they are dying. Here, the phosphorylation is completely reduced. That means this compound particularly targeting the phosphorylation of that particular protein and protecting the cells and giving them longer time lifespan of the fertility, right? Then, this is wonderful. How we are going to do it in the large animals? So for that, what Rohit has done, he went on to the very good new technique, what we call 3D culturing of the ovaries. So what he does, usually morning 4 o'clock, he and Lava wake up and they will go to the slaughterhouse. In Hyderabad, we have very big slaughterhouse. They will go to the slaughterhouse by 3.30 or 4 o'clock. You see, that's what their hard work, you have to understand as a student. They will stay there. They look for pregnant goats who are, uh, goats who are undergoing slaughter and they will collect the fetuses. By 6 o'clock, they will come to the laboratory. And under the microscope, they will dissect the fetuses. They will isolate the ovaries. You see, this is a beautiful goat ovary. At the first day, uh, this is, I guess, fetus ovary. And this is treated ovary. So, and after they take that, they will undergo a culturing. Under the laminar hoods, they will use a specific material and system and uh, media. They will culture them. And they will see these kind of drug kinetics. You see here, this is a beautiful image. This is the early stage goat ovary. All these small greens are, these are eggs. Wood has almost like you can say one million eggs at this time, right? And it goes next, next stages, they will die. So when this is a normal stage, they cultured, for example, 24 hours to 40 hours, maybe one or two days. <coughs> Same culturing they done with the treated, this particular compound, the drug they have added. You see the difference after two days or one day, lot of them they lost. These green foci are very small, very less. Whereas in the treated, you can see there are million. They're enriched. That means this particular drug is saving them. This is not allowing them to die. This is a beautiful way to do that. So later, you'll transfer, transferring this particular technique after working more toxicity and all these things to the livestock, where in our farmhouse, we are directly giving them to the younger goats as the implants to see their follicle survival and their prolificacy and their fertility lifespan, okay? So this is the all of a gist of particular, like this, we have a lot of other stories with livestock related to microscopy. This is what I have shown, shown you, these are the glimpse. So the initial work I have told you, uh, this guy is, you see, with a long beard kind of, uh, you know, goon. This guy is uh, Dr. Mr. Lava. Uh, he works mostly, he's a local guy. He's very helpful in getting all these samples, going to slaughterhouse. And this guy with a big smile, uh, this guy is uh, Rohit. Uh, so this lava did most of the early part, recombination events, goat, pig, chicken, all these things. 
the rohit this guy is a senior phd student he is doing all the this ovarian experiments p3 p63 and p53 and culturing and uh, i have another young phd student she is also working with lot of ovary stuff she has a complete different story and i have two post docs you can see one of them one girl and one guy uh, dr ajay kumar he is working extension of the oocytes life extension he is working with pig oocytes as well as bovine oocytes he is doing wonderful job and the girl who is also post doc uh, dr bhavana she is working generating the animal models particularly cystic ovarian diseases all these things how it can how uh, we can treat them particularly here we are generating the animal models so that we can design drugs and maybe probiotics or something she is doing wonderful job and not only that uh, right now we have some other a lot of un undergrad summer trainees comes and goes they are doing work along with that these are the bottom image these are all my group before as a undergrad uh, trainer in us most of these guys also some of the data i brought it from i mean got from that study also so these are our collaborators uh, the knockout mice michael kuhen neil hunter he was my previous boss atila he is a current collaborator from germany neil is from us and richard he is from uh, cornell and scott is from scott kinney he is from uh, mskk memorial memorial sloan catering new york and all my present and past students and our nib facilities are beautiful our nib family including director and everybody and last but not least i should thank uh, department of biotechnology giving a lot of money and nir is giving me money and uh, department of biotechnology gave me several grants and my ramalinga swami grant and uh, i would like to thank dst also i have several funds grants from dst that's it thank you very much okay uh, this is i have taken almost 2 hours right <laughs> okay if you have any specific any specific question you can post me or you can ask me Uh, thank you dr prasad rao for your uh, informative lecture uh, actually we are we are running running out of time but it, it will be injustice please mute yourself yeah i yeah, am doing that let me go to that mute uh, uh sorry for the interruption uh, we are running out of time but it will be in justice if we want to discuss the question asked by the our uh, attendees so we are having few questions sir uh, one of the question regarding that you told about the sponsored training uh, that uh, sponsorship from scrb so some question is there like is the scrb sponsored training for faculty members too well uh, the answer is no this is strictly for uh, phd students and master students sir another question is that what is the significance of working distance on microscope lens that you have different uh, things are mentioned over the lens so some question is about working distance significance sir yes so uh, significance for example these are my eyes so i want to see my finger if i see my finger from here it's much better if i go a little bit far away like this when you increase the working distance the image quality will be poor the whatever image resolution you are going to get it less so if you have whenever you are, i'm going to get a better picture will reduce the working distance and we'll in introduce the some of the refractive index chemicals such as oil or something so that we can see much better image okay sir so sir, uh, yeah another question is there sir have you checked for the mechanism of summer sub fertility in buffalo uh no no okay actually like uh, the explanation is also there sir we are having one of the most important livestock species as buffalo yeah. especially in the dairy sector and uh, in most of the places because we are having a different type of climates in northern region if you go you will get the cooler temperature whereas in southern region uh, we are having the hot temperature and especially in summers we are having some some fertility problem in buffalo yeah so because of that only that question was asked sir uh, sir one another question is from uh, dr isa mohammed is asking that how do one deal with the 
damaging effect of the fluorescence dye on the live cells does it affect the time lapse microscopy okay uh, am i audible uh, yes, yes sir yes sir audible so, sir what is the question can you repeat sir how do one deal with damaging effect of fluorescence dye on the live cells does it affect the time lapse microscopy yes uh, that's true uh, whenever uh, you are going for longer time lapse giving some hard heating light uh, first thing you are going to damage the cell uh, you are going to particularly when you are keep on sending the cell cell will die light will and it will generate a lot of temperature so my suggestion is particular and the, the next third one is the problem is quenching effect you will lose the signal after for the maybe take 10 laps or 20 laps or 50 laps so the my suggestion is to kill uh, to kill the quenching effect instead of for example someone is going for single gfp you may go for tandem two, two tandem gfp three tandem gfp that's the first thing the damaging of the cell so you cannot protect the cell you have to see two things one is you want to protect the cell or you want to take the longer time lapse so if you want to protect the cell make sure you have a very bright signal and your exposure time is very less for example if you have a very fainter signal you may expose for two one uh, almost 20 seconds if you have a very bright signal your exposure time will come down hardly if you have a millisecond so light goes hits here so that your exposure time will be less so that your damage to the cell will be really, very less uh, and make sure whenever you are going for live cell imaging don't use high end lasers for example with confocal live cell imaging that's a danger confocal lasers will be there they are going to hit if you want to go for live cell imaging better you will go for simple fluorescence microscope that will save you i think uh, it satisfies the question of uh, dr isa mohammed if you have still the question you can ask directly to the speaker you can unmute yourself you can ask the question directly to the speaker no it, it's okay it's okay thank you very much okay so these all questions were there in the zoom platform sir and uh, one request to the participant in, instead of sending the question in personal chat you can send in general so all can read the questions and if they are having the related question something they may also ask too and now i would like to ask dr durga prasad you just go through the questions shared in the youtube channel and you just read them out here okay sir can you hear me sir sir can you hear me yes we are getting okay sir uh, everyone is uh, appreciating you lot sir so many people are saying thank you nice lecture nice presentation and reaching us with so much uh, new techniques and all thank you so one question is asked like uh, how relay criterion define the resolution power of microscope how relay criterion define the resolution power of microscope what criterion i didn't get relay relay r e y r e y l e i g h sir relay sir you can check in the chat box sir the question no, is shared they, here sir they might have uh, different asked uh, probably they were asking the light source uh, uh, maybe the type of um, sir there so uh, definitely resolution comes light source for example light source when you go if you go to the simple microscope where you use a halogen lamp or mercury lamp when you use a mercury lamp whatever you get that light source sometimes you don't get better resolution but that's what high end techniques came into the picture basically we use lasers and attached with laser detectors like gas detectors laser detectors with the lasers laser is powerful definitely if you have a single point like spinning disk or confocal where you throw the lasers at a single point so that you will get a better resolution okay sir thank you sir any other question uh, dr durga prasad no sir only one question they have asked sir. So, sir here uh, we are ending the questions if uh, any participant is having any question you can mail us or directly to the speaker and we will be happy to answer these doubts and whatever things you are having now the session is uh, with kishore sir sir i will request you to uh, that uh, compile that everything what we have discussed here sir so it is over to you sir yeah thank you dr thomas and dr dukka prasad a very big thanks to dr prasad rao for giving a very enlightening uh, insight into the different aspects that we have 
elaborated over the two hour period we are very happy for that your presence would have uh, enlightened uh, many scholars and uh, your offer of getting the summer interviews uh, the phd scholars they can avail of that i hope and it was very good that you threw light initially on the microscopic microscopic techniques contour microscopy and later you shifted to the reproductive processes uh, the different uh, varieties of course it was really very nice uh, you threw light on the different aspects of microscopy and the images were really so good that uh, uh apt to the title that we have put a uh, virtual training program uh, i felt that uh, we are in a laboratory and we were seeing the microscopes and we were seeing the pictures on a screen in the laboratory so it was really like uh, life like experience so it was really very good and uh, you threw a lot of light on uh, the wujens especially the efforts that you try to make and see that uh, how we can uh, counter the menopause that uh, actually happens in nature and uh, how we can uh, extend that uh, fecundity and fertility periods to see that uh, we can have a bigger reproductive cycle in the female now if you compare this oogenesis with the spermatogenesis that we see we know very well that in spermatogenesis every time the mother spermatogonium divides 50% of the cells go into a uh, quiescent stage and always you have a reserve population and you see that in males we never use the word uh, andropause there is nothing like andropause in males similar to what we say menopause in the females so we can take a cue why 50% of the spermatogonia that divide go into a resting phase or a stem cell phase and are always available and we see males that if you are aged 70 80 or 90 in humans you are still sexually very active so what is it that actually happens to see that these 50% reserve cells are always available and why it is not available in the female and uh, you have thrown a very good light on how to counter the oocyte atresia and uh, the mechanisms uh, how to counter the oocyte atresia so uh, it's really very good uh, and uh, very knowledgeable and you have thrown a good light on the that and uh, maybe a day will come when we will see that uh, we can uh, extend the oocytes uh, life and as you said uh, it drops from the 3 million uh, down to hundreds uh, as you age and you reach uh, menopause and uh, hopefully in addition to the number of the oocytes you can also see that uh, the quality of the offspring uh, as the female ages uh, also gets better so very good uh, main uh, light thrown on these uh, concepts and i think uh, the youngsters the scholars and all the researchers would have benefited a lot and i think uh, many would like to work more in this uh, regard especially with respect to the reproductive aspects uh, if some of them are working on in these areas so thank you very much it was really nice and one good thing is all these youtube videos will be available and uh, people can view a many number of times and we are also coming up with a e compendium where all the excellent uh, powerpoint uh, slides that you have shown will be really available again uh, for each and every one apart from the video part uh, in an e compendium they can view any number of times the pictures were really excellent and it gave a life like experience as if we are uh, listening to this in a laboratory thank you very much thank you and uh, we are uh, still in the lunch time only and our uh, afternoon session is scheduled to start by 1:30 and i find no reason why we cannot start by 1:30 we definitely start by 1:30 half an hour is enough for us for a quick lunch and i request uh, all of you to join by 1:30 for the first lecture by professor dr s issue so i think we'll wind this up and uh, we are very happy that uh, this morning day session went on very well i have got a number of requests through whatsapp and email uh,
from people across the globe even now that they did not register and uh, they wanted me to share the youtube link and many of them joined during the session i think uh, some of them joined even 15 20 minutes back also i was keeping a tab on the gmail and on the whatsapp and uh, giving them the link and many of them uh, registered i mean could not register but they joined uh, through the youtube so it was really a very satisfactory one a good job done by all of us and uh, the presence of all the participants uh, has really added to this uh, uh, i request you all to continue in the afternoon session and also please extend and join for the remaining two days and have a good uh, experience thank you all i think we can uh, leave or hold on but be prompt by 1.30 for the next lecture. I request Dr. Ishwari to be ready by 1.30 p.m. Thank you all. You can either hold on or leave the meeting and rejoin at 1.30. It's your choice. Okay, we'll uh, go for lunch. Thank you for the morning session. Dr. Thomar, please unmute yourself if you are saying something to us. Sir, uh, dear participants, uh, you can use the same link for the joining in the Zoom platform as well as in the YouTube. Afternoon, we'll have two sessions, two lectures. One will be related to the stem cell flow cytometry and another will be that immunohistochemistry and its uh, applications. Both lectures will be very good and more oriented towards the practical side as we have attended the first lecture of uh, Dr. HBD Prasad Rao. You can leave the meeting and you can use the same links for the afternoon session also. On behalf of entire organizing committee, I would like to say thanks to all the participants as well as, as, well as the speakers for being with us. Thank you.